How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez here, and uh, we'll be catching up on uh, a lot of weekend news. We haven't been here since Thursday Live. Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. That's good. Anything uh, special over the weekend? How's your weekend? Well, Friday we didn't have the show, so it was kind of boring, but got a lot of work done. Saturday, wrestled down in Oregon. That was pretty fun. Tony Bourne had his annual show at the Ox Club, so we went down Tony Bourne? Wow. I haven't heard that yes, in years. He's still around. He does a show every year, so uh, did that and then did another show right afterwards, so that was fun. And then Sunday, Easter, saw lots of family members and ate a lot of food. There's family members all over the area. We're like the clones, so I got to see everybody. <laughs> Uh, I went to uh, I went to an independent show Saturday in uh, Vallejo, California, with All Pro Wrestling, and um, that was interesting. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think no, it, it it was it was just an independent show. I mean, it wasn't you know particularly good or particularly bad. I think that um, watching it, the one thing that really sprung into my head was, and and judging from the crowd reaction, um, it's it's very tough. There's, there's, it's very difficult to get a crowd into a match, but as far as like getting a crowd into a match, it almost seems, I guess, it almost seems really imperative that your basics are are decent enough. In fact, in fact, you know, you know, the one thing that I think like I was watching this, and 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 one of the things was the building was really cold. So when you get a building really cold, people don't make as much noise. It's just, it's just the the reality. So there's very little heat. Um, almost to the point where, you know, they did the UPW, APW invasion deal. As an actual the, heat in the building, like Fahrenheit? It was very cold. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I mean, I was wearing a sweatshirt and everything. And I was, like, kind of cold. Um, you know, I don't know what it was in the building, but it's probably, like, 60 degrees. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, and, and people just kind of, you know, kind of cold and, and I don't know. But, like, the UPW guys were doing this interview, you know, and, and it was kind of like they were invading. And they really weren't getting any heel heat. And finally, Rick Bassman says something to the effect of, you know, you won't even support your own promotion. You can't stop. And, and then they still didn't react. <laughs> and the only real reaction early in the card was when uh, one of the baby faces turned heel. So, of course, everybody cheered him. And he was talking about how bad the promotion was, and they cheered him more. And about the only thing was Robert Thompson. And about the only thing that sort of got them stopping to cheer him was when he just goes, you know, he was talking about Michael Modest, and he just goes, you know, all you people... Uh, when it comes to Michael Modest, you know, you have all these excuses on why he didn't make it, and the real reason that he's never made it is because he isn't good enough. And then it was kind of like, ooh. And then they started cheering him again about a minute later, because <laughs> when, he, when he went on his rant about everything else. And um, But his match actually um, got heat because it was the only match where, you know, like the blows were stiff and things like that. And the, the, a lot of the undercard guys were doing a lot of nice moves, but they're, you know, like they would throw these weak chops that made no noise, and you could just see that, like, you know, the crowd was, you know, they did a nice move. The crowd was appreciative of the move, but they were reacting to moves and, and not into the match at all. And um, the APW-UPW match when uh, one of the APW guys turned on Donovan Morgan, and, I mean, they just killed him. I mean, it was mega, it should have been mega, mega heat, and the people didn't react at all. But anyway, I don't know how much I want to get into on, on that show. But the one thing that I thought from watching the show when it was over was that there's a lot of moves in wrestling that have been invented that are really cool. And now everyone is doing them, and by everyone doing them, they're like they're not, not really special so cool. anymore. Well, there was like a girl, a uh, cheerleader girl, who did a cheerleader gimmick, and she's not a wrestler. She's um, and so obviously she's trained a little bit, but you know she's a ballet. There's the ballet of the Ballard Brothers, who by the way um, have improved a lot. Uh, Ballard Brothers and Prototype, I noticed a, a big improvement, and then Frankie Kazarian too. Um, watching the show, you know, from the last time I'd seen those guys, which is only a couple months ago, but. Um, the the Ballard Brothers uh, cheerleader, I think her name was cheerleader Melissa, or whatever whatever her name was. Um, she was she did a, uh, a plancha and she did a, a hurricane run off the top rope, and it was it was almost as if the crowd reaction to it was, God, if she could do it, we probably could do it too, you know. Rather and 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 to me it was like okay, so when then the guys do it, it's like well, you know, we've already seen a girl do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, that's just sort of, sort of a thing on. When I saw that, it was like almost like it was a. I hate to use the word exposing the business because this is such a horrible word to use because it's so stupid and makes me. It, it sounds so old fashioned. But I think that like um, exposing the move. Or protecting you know, like, the move. 
Well, don't expose the move to show that, like, you know, you can have a manager or a valet do this cool move because if, if they can, yeah, yeah. then what's so special about, like, a cruiserweight guy doing it? Mm-hmm. So, anyway, that was my little speech from, from that show. Um, let me see what else we have here. Not a whole lot of wrestling news. Uh, Stu Hart's out of the hospital. Um, his situation, from what I gather, was not nearly as serious as, um, as it was made out to be. He did not have pneumonia. Um, he had, he did have fluid in the, in the lungs and near the heart. Um, I believe he's out today of the hospital. He was in the hospital since Thursday. Uh, what else was going on? Um, I just XFL. I don't know. I mean, the ratings were slightly up. They did a on the overnight. They did a 2.0 on Saturday night and a 1.2 on Sunday for the playoff semifinals, which they're up slightly from last week. I think they're both up like two tenths. But for the playoffs, I think that they were certainly hoping for a lot more. And then also. The, the funny thing is the rating got so low that even going up like two tenths, you know they're going to do the press release going XML ratings are up twenty percent. I don't think they can because it's so the number is so embarrassing for a playoff game that mm -hmm. um, they, I don't think they can brag about that that increase. If it was like last week of the season and they did this, they would have. In fact, they did that one week when they did. You know, they went they go up like a tenth of a point. You know, they bragged like they're up thirteen percent or something like that. But um, the um, <laughs> The, you know the final uh, last Sunday's UPN number was uh, .34. That's what they ended up wow. at. Um, but as I sent you that article where they were talking about, you know, if, if if we weren't on NBC, nobody would be talking about how bad our ratings are because our ratings on the other stations that's you know are, are so are, are still good. And I'm just thinking, like, oh yeah, you know, they're what, great. A point three four. What, yeah, what ratings is he talking about? Um, the funniest one was the whole UPN article talking about. Uh, I think we talked about this on Thursday. How. You know, it's doing better than the, the uh, same time slot last season or whatever when there was no programming in that time. He didn't slot have any season. programming. It's not doing better or worse. It was up infinite programs. percent. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, they uh, they did not draw well in Los Angeles or Orlando for the semifinals, which is also kind of sad. And then the worst part is is that the championship game is going to be at Orla um, in in Los Angeles. It's Los Angeles, San Francisco, and. Um, they only did about 8,000 people legitimate at the Coliseum. They claimed a lot more than that, well, a little bit more than that. But um, to go back, I mean, if they're going to have that championship game and have like, you know, 10, 11,000 people at that Coliseum, oh, well, oh, well, it's, I guess I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, let's see. Um, New Japan is in the news. Uh, in this country, saying that they're preparing an IPO, there's actually, as far as I can tell, there's no news in their country about it. So I'm trying to find out what they're saying in Japan about it. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, we got a raw lineup. Uh, let me see. Actually, it looks let's... like a hell of a show. Yeah, Jeff Hardy against Triple H for the Intercontinental. They may do Steve Austin against Matt Hardy as well. I'm not sure about that one. Edge and Christian against uh, Hardcore Hollies for the tag team title, which was the match they were supposed to have on SmackDown. Uh, Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, which probably be a hell of a match. Regal against Benoit. I, you know, I just hope that those that those two matches that we just mentioned get like you know five six minutes rather than like a two minute and the because the, you know they're, they're going to end in. with the run ins. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're going to end with the run ins. So just give them a little bit of time before the run in. Bubba Ray Dudley. Well, is if just they're incredible. leading that, you know, if they're leading to that tag match with uh, Angle and Regal versus Benoit and Jericho, there's got to be a run in in one of those matches. Oh, there's going to be a run in. Both I don't of encourage them. it, but I just know there's going to be. No, I mean there will be in both of them. I'm just saying that I hope they get some time before they get there. So uh, yeah, on paper, uh, on paper looks like a good show. Um, a lot of the WCW stuff uh, is going to be taken care of this week. Jim Ross is going to Atlanta, I think Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, to meet with wrestlers, potential front office people. Um, uh, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to talk about about that. They're going to be running the TV tapings on ever on Saturday night as a regular thing because the feeling is is that uh, they will have a very difficult time drawing on Wednesday uh, and an easier time on Saturday, and uh, they don't want empty buildings, so. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it, it makes sense, I and mean, I think it's the right move on that on that account as well. Um, the feeling within the company is is that the guys like even Booker T probably will not be ready by June the ninth because they won't have the contracts worked out. I mean, they hope that they will, but they are thinking they probably won't. That first show, there's a game going on right now between um, Time Warner and WWF, and what it is is Time Warner. I don't know if you've heard about this, but they have offered in the last couple of days. They have started offering people buyouts at 50 cents on the dollar, which most of the guys are very cold towards taking. And I think that what their deal is is that they want WWF to uh, pick up the contracts, feeling that at least some of the big contracts WWF will be forced to pick up because by June the 9th, if they don't have any stars on that show, 
they're going to go in there in that weak time slot, do a bad first rating, or, or do a bad first show without star power. Because people will tune in expecting Bill Goldberg and Ric Flair, and then not, you know, if the biggest stars are Lance Storm and Mike Awesome, um, could be, uh, you know, it's not the way to start, put it that way. So that's the WCW yeah. side. The, the WWF side is, is that they are not going to take, they're not going to buy any more contracts, and they can start without Booker T and DDP and Ric Flair, you know, and they don't, they don't need any of them. They're going to make it go somehow. The dollar's better than, I would have thought they would have offered like 33 if they were going to play that game or something. Because there was yeah. so much talk about, like, 30 cents on the dollar or whatever. And it was only 30 cents on a dollar for Goldberg. That was the only one because of, that, oh, okay. of how much money it was. The other guys, it was the talk was um, some 40%, I mean, some 40 cents and some 70 cents. Hmm. So, and I don't know who's what. I only know that uh, two guys have gotten off for 50. Not for 70 cents, why not take it? Well, for 70 cents, you would take it. If you were going to get, you know, a, a pay, you know, you get 70 cents on the dollar and then a paycheck from WWF as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you would. Uh, but the 70 cents guys would be the real low end guys. Yeah. So, so anyway, it, everything's kind of in a holding pattern, but I expect that, um, I expect some decisions. You know, I'm sure they'll be... have a big star on that show. I mean, even if it's, even if something happens and on, you know, June 8th, this. nothing has worked out, they'll, they'll put somebody from the WWF that's a fairly big name over there. They're not going to go into that first show with nobody. Billy Gunn. Well, Billy Gunn will probably There's end just up no there. way. Especially yeah. the first one. Well, it's going to be interesting. I think uh, they better have a good first show, though. And we've already seen with the XFL, especially with that time slot. I, 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 when I was at that um, independent show on Saturday, I talked to a bunch of people, who, you know, none of whom knew what was going on as far as this thing goes. And then when I told them that time slot, I mean, every, you should have seen the facial reactions. It was like <laughs> it's it was like it's doomed. And that surprised me because I just figured, you know, these are hardcore wrestling fans. You know, they're gonna they're gonna find it and watch it. And it was like when they heard Saturday Night at eleven, it was like, oh my god. Uh, let's see. Poll question. Where do we have it? Do you think there will be a second season of the XFL? A yes, B no. We've actually been getting um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, tampered with poll results. Actually, we're having uh -oh. like yeah, the last I'd say pr probably in the last week because we usually get a certain number of results, and we've been getting like you know like 500 more than usual on some days, and they're all voting the exact same way. So I kind of like just say yeah. If one person wants about 500 times, I mean, it doesn't really mean anything in the final end of a result. So, so anyway, <laughs> that's what happened. Why this would you waste precious moments of your life skewing with the Wrestling Observer Live IATA poll? I don't know. I don't know. How long does it take to, to vote 500 times? I don't know. So, anyway. I never tried to vote. I think a yeah. while. Okay. Well, it was Easter. I guess that's true. Okay. Any any more news to talk about before we uh, see? Uh, can we talk about the uh, Noah Championship? Yeah, we can talk about that. Um, Mitsuharu Masao won yesterday over Yoshihiro Takayama. They did draw a sellout at the Ariake Coliseum. Uh, Misawa got his jaw re realigned or out knocked out of alignment by a real stiff high kick. Uh, then Saturday in uh, they had the first they had the Budokan and they did an om they almost sold out. You know what's funny was about that about the Budokan. Is that a couple of months ago, if you'd said like the first match ever with uh, Toshiaki Kawada and Keiji Muto, my feeling was that if it drew any less than about 45,000 people, you'd be disappointed. And here they don't even sell Budokan, and, and things have gotten so bad that I'm considering that a success. You know, yeah. they, they did, you know, like almost 14,000 people or whatever the real number was. Um, you know, they claimed 15,8, but it was a little bit less than that. But I mean, I was, it was a pretty packed building, and, uh, Muto won. And I guess the deal is is that Kawada is going to get his um, forearm uh, rested for a couple of months and then come back. So that's why he lost three three big matches in uh, in a row. Um, and I think that on June the 8th, they're going to do the tag champions from each side against each other, Taoki and Johnny Smith of All Japan against Satoshi Kojima and Hiroyoshi Tenzan at Budokan. And actually that... What about uh, that, Mudo and Tenru? And Mudo and Tenru will probably be the main event for the Triple Crown, which um, Mudo and Tenru, I mean, you get two crippled up guys... So that one may be tough, but they've had great matches in the past. But that tag team match is going to be fantastic because those mm -hmm. guys, you know, Kojima and Tenzan are a great team, and, and Taioki is really, really good. And Johnny Smith's one of those, you know, good workers that's really underrated, doesn't get the, you know what I mean? In, in a situation like that, in a big match, uh, I think that they're, you know, plus interpromotional on All Japan Turf. I think that'll be, that match I think will be very, very good. Cool. Okay. Uh, you know, Saturday night I decided, you know, I'm going to find out the, uh, Results of the Kawada Muto match. 
And so I found this thing on the Internet that translates web pages that are in another language. Really? And so, really, yeah. And I went up to the uh, went up to the page and everything, and it translated it out. And the good news was there was some English on the page. With bad news was I still couldn't read one damn thing on the whole page. <laughs> Didn't translate well enough, huh? Did not translate very well at all. But it was a good it was a good idea. Okay, let's see what we got here. We'll start with some emails. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, since becoming a fan of pro wrestling in Japan, I've always wondered why American companies don't try to work to the all and new Japan prototypes. Uh, the fact is, when there's compelling ring action, people like watching it. The catch is, the ring work has to really be smoking. Without that, you have nothing. Um, there's, hey, there's nothing wrong with with good ring work, but you know, the, you know, you need more than that. You know, here's another thing. I, I got when I was at that show, I'm talking to a different guys and thinking about this, and I was watching this three way, okay. And you know, you you work in Pinterest. Every single independent show I get a result of has three ways and four ways, okay. Now. I, it, the match was not particularly good because three ways and four ways, 80% of the time make for bad matches unless you've got like great workers in there. And I, and because it's more difficult to work the match. Now, Paul Heyman popularized these things, but I don't think that they draw any good, any extra money. When you have green guys doing it, they usually make for terrible matches. How come, it, it, you know, I was, I was starting to have this thing, you know, where, where, you know, like everyone in wrestling, it's like monkey see, monkey do. And like if you do something, like a big promotion does something really good. I mean, I, I you know, wrestling's all about copying, right? But you know, one thing that I've always thought, and I never could understand, and this has to do with the Japanese and as well as the independents here, is that if there's something that, say, WCW does, like really stupid, like that one-finger title push, right? Yeah. Someone on the independent, as stupid as that is, w it was going to do it. Or, you know, like, not to say three ways when ECW popularized them were a dumb idea. They were sort of an ECW innovation um, that, that, you know, the, the three-way tag team dance, so to speak, and then, you know, I guess they, they kind of got put on the map with that three-way with Sabu and Shane Douglas and Terry Funk years and years ago. But it's like, if you don't have guys who know how to do it, why don't they just do singles matches? Why do they always have to, you know, like the idea that you got to do a three-way or a four-way tag match, and then you've got these guys trying not to step on each other's toes because it's so much more difficult to na navigate around the ring in? I don't know, Brian, what, what's... I think, I think part of it is... um. You know, on a lot of independent shows, sometimes you'll get an extra guy there or whatever, a couple of extra guys, and they don't really think the whole thing through, and it's not like they're writing WWF TV. It's just like, well, we'll put you in this match. You guys can do a three-way. It's not even something they really think about. And I think that, like, a lot of the things that you see on TV, a lot of wrestlers and promoters, even though they're actually in the wrestling business, don't really follow it enough to know that that one-finger punch uh, helped kill World Championship Wrestling. It was just like, well, you know, Kevin Nash and Hulk Hogan did this deal. They're two huge stars. They did it on Nitro. Uh, you know, the fans threw garbage in the ring. So, you know, it must have been over. Let's do something like that. So I don't think that... It's just like, you know, you watch the... We're just talking about the um, the tournament with the DQs and the countouts. And it's like, why would Nassau book a match with a countout and a DQ in a tournament when those things don't get over in the U.S.? But the fact is, they don't get over, but they're still being done in the WWF, which is, like, you know, the place to be. So I, I just think that's why they do I mean, it's not like, you know, they're writing, they're just going, like, well, let's get a three-way here, let's get a tag match, let's get a uh, hardcore match. I don't think promoters really think like that. I think it's just no, like they shows, the guys they, they have. And I think they, I think they do on independent, on independent shows. You always have to have a hard. It, it just seems like the, you have to have hardcore. That's another one, too. Um, well, I mean, I mean, the hardcore, I think that, I don't know. I mean, hardcore is something that I think that it's like as a change of pace. If you have like nine matches on a show, having one match and one's you know, hardcore, you know, having different matches, that's okay. But like, I, I don't know. I was just the, the three-way thing because I see so few good ones, especially at the independent level. I'm just thinking like, why do you even do them? And instead of like say in a tag situation doing a three-way, why don't you just make put two guys in a, a singles match and have the other two guys do a tag team match and then make for probably less bad matches, so to speak. Yeah. You know, a less bad match. That's those matches know. are so hard to do, those three ways. I know. Well, they're, they're hard to do for, like, stars. Because, like, most yeah. of the time with stars, when they do the three ways, they're usually not that good unless you got, like, you know, Hunter and Rock and Kurt Angle out there doing it because they do it. You know, they work so often, and they're awesome workers. You know, but for, like, the mid-card guys doing, you know, I don't know. That's why I was so impressed with that uh, four-way at the No Way Out show. That was like a miracle to me. Yeah. This you know, another thing I was just thinking about, too, if you look at, like, posters from the old days, 
a poster could be made with like a main event at the top, and then underneath there'd just be a listing of you know blank versus blank. And because it was like territories, you know, it was a bunch of names that people would recognize. Whereas nowadays, with any wrestling, you know, shows are run maybe once a month, maybe once every three months. You know, different venues. It's not like a weekly deal. So if you make a poster with just blank versus blank, nobody knows who any of those people are. And so I think the idea is, well, we'll put triple threat match here in big letters, and we'll put hardcore match here in big letters, and we'll put midget uh, match, midget match or whatever, because those are things that people can at least relate to because they've seen it on TV. Whereas if they just saw a poster filled with random names, they just go, yeah, okay, great, triple uh, A, minor league wrestling or whatever. Why go? Interesting. Yeah, that, that that actually makes some sense. But then you got to watch them anyway. Well, that's um, true. And the guys have to do them. I mean, it's like you know, if, if they're ready to do them and can and can pull it off, it's one thing. But when you watch, you know, it, it's harder. And and some guy, you know, it makes for a, a I don't know. Anyway, this is from Bruce. It goes back in the late '60s and early '70s. There's a wrestler called Batman. I heard he was a friend of Bruno San Martino's who was going nowhere and asked Bruno if he could help get him over with a gimmick. Bruno was not into those gimmicks, but went along with it to help out his friend. I was wondering if this is a true story. We're actually going to have Bruno here uh, Wednesday, and I think the story's true, and it's Tony Marino was the guy, but we can talk to Bruno about Batman uh, in Pittsburgh. Bruno was the booker, in fact, when he did that. Uh, new possible taglines for the new WCW. WCW, the new home of Billy Gunn. It's daisy uh, <laughs> Season premiere June the 9th. It's either this or the, the XFL, and damn it, you've got to watch one of them. Uh, new owners, new time slot, new network, same old wrestling. And WCW Saturday Nitro Live starring Shane McMahon and featuring the Not Ready for Monday Night players. I don't think that that's... I watched Heat last night and Billy Gunn worked a match, and he seriously is Sean Stasiak, like 10 years older. Well, they could do the feud. Looks just like him, works just like him. Oh. Uh, he's a little more over, though. Like, a lot more over. That's true. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, I got this. Will most of the light heavyweights that WCW, WWF signs from now on be sent to WCW? Um, you know, when it comes to this, a lot of this talent stuff, believe me when I tell you this. Believe me, because I know most of the people who were involved. This is, oh, this is, most of these decisions have not fully even been made. Um, I think that, I think it would be, it's an interesting idea for WCW to be like the light heavyweight promotion, so to speak, because they could have quicker ring in action and things like that. I just don't know in that time slot. The time slot is very tough. I'll tell you what, booking that time slot, I was talking with somebody about, like, you know, laying out that time slot. And it's like, you know, the traditional thing would be, you know, you build for, for an hour and a half or hour and 45 to a main event match. But in this case, the main event's going to be 1245, and by then you're going to lose some of your audience, and we don't know how much, because until you look at the quarter hours, you really don't know. It's um, like those old Saturday night main events. Well, Saturday night main events, they, we, I was actually, actually earlier today. the main event first. I, earlier today, I was looking up those old Saturday night main events, and generally speaking, they put the main event either first or second. And then they yeah. usually ended with kind of like a nothing match, because the feeling is that, you know, by 1245 a.m., people are going to sleep, or a lot of yeah, people Yeah, but if, anyway. you look, if you really look at when Raw is preempted... And it's moved to like 11 o'clock on Monday. I don't really think there was a huge drop throughout. I, I actually should look back at this, but I don't think there was like a huge drop. There was, n to the there main was not event. a huge. There was a drop, but there was not a huge drop. You're right. Um, and, but the thing is, that's Monday night where people are tuned in, and it was the sh you know when when WWF did good numbers on Monday night from 11 to 1. That was a very hot product. You can believe me if your product's super hot, you'll draw 11. You'll draw 11 to 1. It's not a death time slot for a hot product. It's a death time slot no. for a cold product. I mean, why but, uh, why would you stay up till eleven o'clock to watch wrestling, and not have enough to stay up till one? I mean, if little children are staying up till one o'clock on a Monday night when Raw is preempted, I'm sure they can you, do it Saturday night. You know, that'd be really interesting to look up the demographics for those weeks to see how many little children were still up. at like, I think you did that once, and I think there were a lot of little kids still up at one o'clock. Yeah, there there were there were like hundreds of thousands actually. <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. Antoine, uh, where in the world is D'Lo Brown? It looks like he's going to be shipped to WCW. That's another decision that has not been made, although it, it could very well happen. Uh, is Jerry Lynn still young enough to have a productive WF career? I hear he's 38 years old. I think he's right about 38. That sounds like his age to me. Um, I mean, if they if they want to give him a productive career, he can because he's a good enough wrestler. But it'll be tough, and my gut feeling is, is that he's not going to get that break. Uh, what do you mean by like a productive career? That's a good question. Well, 
I mean, look at Dallas Page. I mean, they're talking about bringing him in because he's a hard worker, and he's a lot older than Jerry Lynn. And everyone's talking about Jerry Lynn's having these great matches, you know, on the road and in the dark matches. If he, you know, if he goes out there, it doesn't matter if he's 38. They're not going to have a shirt on him that says, I'm 38. If he looks good and he has good matches, I think he can go well. Yeah, I think he's got the size thing working against him and the, and the lack of interview ability working against him. Yeah. But that doesn't matter his age. You know, you know what? When it comes to his age, his age is probably not even a factor. It's those other things that are the factor. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly how much does Tony Mamaluke really weigh? Most sites, including ECW, give bogus weights. I saw one match where he slid between the two bars and the guardrail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what yeah, you think. He did do that. What do you think, 140? I was reading somewhere he was listed at like 150. And if weights and wrestling are usually, uh, you know, I'd say probably about 130. 130? Wow. Yeah, I was thinking maybe 140, but you might be right. He's not he that tall. He can't be either. much taller than me. And when I was 140, I was not as skinny as Tony Wamalink. Okay, so one, you know, Guido. What do you think Guido, of Guido really is? What, Guido, no. I bet, is probably about uh, 160 top. 160. And he's a lot lighter than Guido. He could be 135, 140, 135 maybe. Yeah. He's very thin. Um, let's see. I don't think I would have ever made it through a guardrail. The WWF's purchase of WCW was the second most important wrestling story of the last 30 years. The first was the demise of the JWA and the rise of All Japan and New Japan from 1971 to early 1973. I know when Oki was fired in December 71, why did Baba leave? Because the company was about to go under and Baba... Both Baba and Inoki um, wanted more power from the old company. And then Inoki left and um, Baba basically, you know, wanted... To, Baba wanted to go out on his own because Baba, once, you know... Baba was really, in that era, actually a bigger star than Anoki. And, you know, he was the number one guy, and, and it was kind of one of those things. He wanted to go at it, and he wanted to be a promoter, so he started up his own company. And once he left, and this was after Anoki left, and the company was starting to fall in financial problems because a lot of the owners had really bad gambling problems. Uh, it wasn't that the business was necessarily so bad. Um, I think maybe that's another reason why Baba wanted to leave, was, you know, maybe... He didn't want to be owned by those guys and figured he could do it himself. And obviously, it was, he made millions doing it. So anyway, that was that was the story back then. I uh, just want you to know that the Backseat Boys, Trent Acid and Johnny Cashmere, won heat last night as the Backseat Dudleys, and Albert put them through a table on the WF New York stage. Do you think they'll be kept around for a while? No. Uh, probably not, no. Uh, who would you think is the best wrestler in New Japan right now? Um, I don't know, Yuji Nagata, Koji Kanemoto when he's healthy, Minoru Tanaka as junior heavyweight and heavyweight Yuji Nagata. Uh, will the WF move, will Raw move to a pre tape format now that the Monday Night Wars are over? No, no, they will not. Uh, what was the final tally for Monday Night Wars? Like who won most weeks? I don't know. What's the deal with Canyon? I heard his contract was up this month. Um, WWE have won, but I don't know the numbers, so. Um, as far as Canyon goes, WF would like to have him, um, you know, same deal as everybody else that we talk about. I mean, there's no, you know, everyone's deal is pretty much the same except for the ones that they really don't want. Uh, is there anyone in CCW or XPW you think is talented enough to compete in the WF right now? I have not seen enough of those different guys. Um, Trent Acid, uh, I think, is the one that I saw who I thought was pretty damn talented. Um, and there may be you know, others. There's got to be something on the XPW website, or there's got to be something passed out at XPW shows that asks people to send you questions about XPW. Because for the amount of people that they draw, we get a lot of emails. More than you would expect. Mm, no only, because, couple of weeks. only because, I think only because just it's, someone wants to talk about something besides WWF. And, and they want to talk about wrestlers coming to WWF, and those are the independents that get the most play. CCW and XPW, they're just the ones that have the most attention right now. Um, I, I don't know, the only thing I can think of. Is it legal for Eric Bischoff to tell guys not under contract to sit home until he and Hogan form their con their company, or is it considered contract tampering? Well, if they don't have a contract, how could it be tampering? So the answer to that is no. It is no. I mean, the answer is that is yes. It is legal. Totally legal. Uh, I know this topic has been beaten to death, but in regards to Jerry Lawler firing, uh, believe it or not, Jerry Lawler was not fired. <laughs> Jerry Lawler quit. He quit on his own uh, because he thought that uh, he would be able to get a job in WCW and get his wife a job in WCW, and if all things had gone the way everyone expected, he would have, but it didn't happen. And so it turned out, in hindsight, that walking out may not have been the right decision. But as far as um, uh, he wasn't fired, and it was not, I do not believe that it was a plot to get rid of him. I mean, a lot of people attribute, 
Not, not that Vince McMahon hasn't done plots before, but um, I think that it was just as simple as uh, they wanted Stacy Carter out for whatever reason. And, I think there may uh, have been a plot to get Stacy out, but oh, no, nothing that, with Waller. That, that yeah, I, I, well, I'm sure you know. I'm sure that there was something there. You know, I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know so much a plot as much as you know. People people complained about her in you know in in Moss. Many complaints in one day. You know what? I, what you know if you really look back at the timing of all this. Vince had just come back from a weekend of the XFL, okay, um, and he had the, the pay-per-view. And, you know, I mean, you know, hey, the, the guy, the, the guy, you know, he, you know, you saw him on Costas. I mean, you know, the XFL is tough. It's a tough deal. You know, when you go in there and you're told for two straight years by everyone in the world and you're just making nothing but money, and then you do this IPO and you make, you know, $186 million in cash, you're just swimming in money, you can do no wrong, your enemies are just like... Uh, Looking real bad at every turn because you're making so much money, right? Your ratings are down a little bit, but so what? They're still the highest rate show on, on cable. And then you go in there and you think that, you know, you are the promotional genius and you can beat the NFL because the NFL's got this tired old product and they're ready for the taking. And then you go in there and, and you're in a, something, a game that you don't know and, and the end result is this. And it's, it's, it's kind of like that rude awakening and, and you probably was not in a pretty good mood. And then people come up one after the other and go, that woman is this and that, and look at what she did on that pay-per-view, you know, and all this. And he's probably just like, what do I, you know, screw this. She's got no talent anyway. Let's get rid You know, really, I'm sure that's what he was thinking. We have a million women. She's not the most over. She's got no special talent other than she happens to be. The only reason she's here in the first place is because she's Jerry Lawler's wife. And that is the only reason she was there. So it's just, get, you know, well, we don't need this. You know, we, we fired Sable. She was a superstar. Or actually, she quit. I shouldn't say they fired her, but... The same thing. We lost Sable. We lost Steve Austin. God knows we can lose any. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're, you know, who cares? And I don't think he thought about, like, the idea of Lawler leaving. And then when Lawler left, it was just like, screw you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't care. I'll just put somebody else there. And he called up Heyman, put Heyman there, and, and that's what happened. And, uh, if it had been, you know, if it had been handled differently, uh, Lawler could have been back, but, uh, it doesn't look like it right now. You know, as far as considering, like, the NFL a tired old product or whatever, I was writing up that Costa deal over the weekend, and Vince was talking about you cannot build a brand in one year. The NFL's been around for 75 years. And right then I thought, you know, why didn't Vince think about that before he even started? I mean, there's a reason no. that that thing's been around for 75 years. If it was yeah. a tired old product and nobody cared, it wouldn't be around, or it would have changed. Well, you know, for 75 years, that's like, that's like, Vince should have thought, you know, if this thing's around for 75 years, and uh, we claim to be around for 50, <laughs> how would someone start up and compete with me? What would they be able to do? But he didn't think that. He thought, well, I can do it. I can beat these yeah. guys. Yeah. You know, the other, the, the other thing, the other thing now, like, you know, now the thing that they're, the, I don't want to get too much into XFL, because obviously not that many people care about it, but um, I, 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 uh, uh, the other day I saw, like, they had a full-page ad, in uh, the San Francisco Chronicle for, you know, to, to watch the games, the two playoff games. And they're listing, like, all the stars on each team. And I'm looking at this, and I'm going, like, th they're trying to get over these stars for this game. And I'm thinking, every single one of these guys is going to be in an NFL camp next year. And they're kind of, and some, some of the people who are bragging about the XFL go, you know, there's going to be a lot of guys in the XFL in camp next year. And before the season ever started, Brian, who, who, Brian knows nothing about football, self-admitted. Okay, But we were talking about, like, every star is going to end up in the XFL next season. And, and, and that's like the problem ECW had, and it's not, that's not how you build a league by creating a star and then losing it to the rival league. Yeah. And I mean, so the whole anyway. thing was, Vince talked about it in the interview as well. He goes, you know, the NFL's already, already talked about stealing some of our production ideas. And I'm just thinking, wait till they steal that first player. Just wait. It's yeah, but go here's the thing. Steal, okay, steal the production ideas. Brian, didn't we say before the very first game was played that if they have any good ideas, they're going to be in the NFL next season? Any good oh, ideas yeah. or great players, they're all going to be in the NFL next year, just like ECW. And can yep. Vince handle being the ECW of football? Well, you know, the ECW didn't make any money either, obviously, as we've seen by the bankruptcy well, Look papers. where they are today. Look where they yeah. And it's like, unfortunately, you know, that's... Whatever. Uh, you know, um, this is from Harry Simon, who goes to deal with John Tenta. This is John Tenta thing. Was the big bu Bubba and the Dungeon of Doom shaved half of John Tenta's head and angle? I actually read somewhere that the premise was that John Tenta himself reshaved the half of his head every morning to remind him of hatred towards Bubba. I remember that interview because it made no sense why did the <laughs> head of hair always stay like that? And it was, that was the reason that was given when they asked about that. What do you think was the greatest match ever? I will not even attempt to answer that question. Oh, There's man. just too many. Uh, just, just too many. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, more WCW shows. Watch us now because we'll be dead in a year. WCW Jacked. I think they already have that name. WCW No Star Power. Late, my, late Night with Shane McMahon. And the following is a paid commercial for World Championship Wrestling. Uh, let's see. I was watching the first in your house and I was wondering who was Jerry Lawler's mom. Uh, probably a model. I don't know. Do you know who, was that anyone who's special? Who was Jerry Lawler's? Oh, that's Don't remember they had Mother's Day and they had some girl who was like 25 years old be Jerry Lawler's mom? Probably just some model. Yeah, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, I've just seen an incredible match with Kawada against Steve Williams. Hopefully, it was. I don't think it was a match the other day, but uh, I mean, in, in the past, you know, in the '90s, God, they had great matches. What other Kawada match would you recommend? Any Budokan Hall main event? There's hundreds of them. Um, you know, Kawada with Kobashi, Akiyama, Misawa, Tawe, Steve Williams, even Stan Hansen. If you go back far enough, uh, pretty much any Kawada main event. Um, Kensuke Sasaki, the guy's just awesome. Uh, is the plan still for Backlash a one-on-one -on -one match with Benoit and Angle? As of about a week ago, it was not. It was a tag match, but um, until it's announced, I mean, they constantly change these lineups. Um, and I have not talked to anyone. Uh, I have not talked to anyone regarding uh, like the lineup for Backlash since Tuesday. So I mean, tonight they may restructure everything because again, even the main event hasn't been officially announced. So they may they could still change and put the Hardys in, depending on what they do tonight. Brian, you told me you're almost uh, almost done with the issue already. That's amazing. I know this I weekend I just started writing, and I think most of it was that Bob Costas thing, which I think subliminally I kept telling myself unconsciously to not write that article because it was going to be so damn long, and it ended up being like two or three pages long. And last night at like one o'clock, I went back and checked, and the entire issue is almost done. And I haven't even put in the TV reports yet. There's like today, tomorrow, all the news, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And no the, um, WCW. Yeah. It, it, um, what was I going to say? With the, um, it took me one, but it took me a good two, three pages to go over that thing. Mm -hmm. Bob Costas thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are the best matches on the Wrestling Gold DVDs? Any five star matches on it? There are no five star matches on that tape. Um, the best matches, I think, uh, Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo against our uh, Rock and Roll Express matches were pretty good. Um, I think there was a pretty good Tully Blanchard Manny Fernandez match. No, no, Nick Nick Bockwinkle Manny Fernandez. There might have been a good Tully Blanchard Manny Fernandez as well. Um, it's 80s stuff. I mean, it, it's it's very different. I mean, when I watched it, you know, and I lived through all that and, and had seen almost uh, virtually every one of those matches before. And, and actually, between Cornette and I, we'd we'd actually been live at about half of them. Um, but um, it's it's diff it's a different style. That's all I could say. But um, for the style, a lot of them were good, and a lot of it. There, there was. I'll tell you what the worst match was. I think, actually, some of the there might have been some like really short matches, like a Sheik match or something that was just dreadfully horrible. But, but I mean, as far as a long match, there was a match with with Bob Sweetan and Jerry Lawler that went like 20 minutes, and I mean they like never locked up. I mean it was so ungodly horrible. And Cornette loves Jerry Lawler, but by the end of that match, even he had to admit that this match was like atrocious, and we were just like the whole time. I think that he admitted it on commentary by the end, yeah. So I think there was a point <laughs> was about say, how could you watch like a horrible match and do commentary and we were. like be praising it or whatever? How could oh, you I not go, my God, this is horrible? I think, what are they going to lock about, up? I think about ten minutes in, I think I was going like, oh my, I think I was going like, well, now we know my Southwest Championship Wrestling died as a territory. Poor Bob Sweetan, when you see him, oh, it was he was looking bad. I mean, because every the other thing about that match was, I mean, he really did nothing because. What little was done in that match was done by Lawler. I mean, he did everything. And, and that wasn't much. He, it wasn't one of Lawler's great performances. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You know, see. as much as I used to make fun of Tony Schiavone and some of the other commentators for WCW, some days I would sit there, like, watching Thunder, and I would think to myself, you know, if I were hired to do announcing for this show, I would be fired the next day. I could not do it. I could not sit there and try to pretend like Van Hammer versus Sean Stasiak was a good match. It would just be completely impossible for me. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mike from Pennsylvania asks, what is Kevin Von Eric up to now? I just know he's living in Texas. Have you heard anything about I mean, I, I hear his name every now and then, but um, I don't know what he's doing. Ever since World Class Close-Up Shop, I haven't heard anything about him. Is he active in any phase of wrestling? No, he's not in any phase. Would you ever get him on the show? Oh, I would say no. I don't see any point. Uh, what happened on Piper's Pit with Rocky Johnson? Piper seemed to be uncharacteristically stiff with his shots. 
I, I think that's just, you know, because the cameras were up close. I don't think there was anything like that. Did this turn into a shoot since Piper made a racial comment like you should be shining your shoes? That's just, what, again, as bad as that looks now, when you look back, that was just what people did in wrestling. And I'm not defending it because I didn't like it when they did it in the 80s, you know, the racial stuff. But they did do it. And, you know, Rocky Johnson lived with that being a, being a wrestler uh, in many territories. So, I mean, he's not going to lose his temper over that. That was just what was known as building heat in those days, and they just did it. And he's got a list of w ECW wrestlers and wants to know what their chances of are getting a shot in the WWF. Let's see, Danny Doring, uh, not good right now. Guido, I know uh, Heyman wants to get him into WCW. We'll see. The decision hasn't been made. Tony Mamaluke, same thing. Mikey Whipwreck, uh, just don't see it. It's going to be a tough one. That's a tough one. Sinister Minister, don't see. Chetty. Uh, I mean, he's worth some dark matches. They may give him a developmental. Tom Marquez, I don't think so. Roadkill. Mm, you know, he's kind of talented for a big guy. Uh, yeah. just doesn't have the look that they like. Uh, Red Dog, I don't know enough about. Michael Shane. Um, I, mean, I was reading an interview with Roadkill, and he's talking about Al Snow came up with his gimmick. And I thought, that is an Al Snow gimmick if I've ever heard one. Yeah. Steve Carino, I think... Um, I have not heard anything. You know, he left on bad terms with Paulie, so that didn't, that may not help. And he was now like, what happened much, there? Uh, I think, I, you know, I don't know the whole detail, all the details other than, you know, it's the whole money thing, you know. I mean, they, you know, you saw, they were saying stuff about each other, you know, especially Paul. Uh, well, actually, probably both sides. Simon Diamond, uh, probably good, good shot at developmental deal. Francine, uh, I wouldn't. Don Marie, again, good shot at developmental. Chili Willie, I don't see. Sandman, I don't see. Matthews in New York already got a developmental. And Dreamer, I expect, will be in WWF in some form. Hey, what would you do? What are you going to do? If, you're, if you were writing, uh, booking, uh, the Jeff Hardy uh, Hunter match tonight, what do you do? Just a question. Um, God, that's a tough one. I mean, I don't think that Jeff should lose the belt tonight. And I hate, like, run-ins and lame things like that. But I think what's going to happen is it's probably going to be Jeff versus Hunter. And uh, Austin runs in and they just kill the kid. I mean, if I were doing it, I seriously would put Jeff Hardy over him again. Uh, it's a possibility that they, they may just, they do have, that. You know, if they if they are serious about building people up, then they really need to build people up. I mean, if you look back, look at Shawn Michaels when he gave the belt to Austin. I mean, it was clean in the middle with the stunner, and it was over. And okay, but you know, really are trying okay, to put okay, people okay, over, that was they good. put him over Brian, clean. Brian, Brian, Brian. Brian, I got to tell you something about yeah, that. Yeah, I know. It was it was his last match and everything like it that. It was his last match and and you know you know about what Undertaker and everything, don't you? Do you know the story about that? As far as that that la the on story. that that night? No. With Undertaker and everything with Shawn Michaels on that last that night in Boston? Do you know the story? story. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, Sean was complaining and complaining and complaining. He didn't want to do the job even though it was his, it was going to be his last match. Everyone knew it was his last match. All of a sudden, he was complaining about dropping the title, felt Austin hadn't deserved it, hadn't paid his dues, you know, things like that. And, you know, it was actually a, it was a pretty big issue. So anyway, what, they, what happened was the night of the show, um, as Sean went through, and he was supposed to lose, okay, um, Undertaker taped up his fist. He went up to Sean and starts taping up his fist. And, you know, going like, what's this all about? And it's just like, you're doing the job. <laughs> That's okay, true story. that was a bad example. But in general, no, but the, end result, the end result was the right thing. How yeah, the end result, result was the right thing. But I'm just saying in yeah. general, when they want to put over a star, when they want to make somebody, they make somebody by giving them a clean win over a superstar. You know? I mean, if you look back, I'm trying to think of a good example, because now I'm just totally screwed up because I got the Shawn Michaels deal. But, I mean, if they really <laughs> want to make Jeff Hardy, if they really want to make him and they think he's going to be the next Shawn Michaels or wherever, and they want to give him this big push towards the top, he's got to beat Hunter clean. Otherwise, they're not doing all they can. I, there's different things that there's different ways to do it. You know, I mean, I, I, I just want to watch how they do it tonight because I don't know. I, I mean, there's, you know, Hunter could win and it could still elevate Jeff depending on how Hunter does it and the way it's done. And and yeah, Jeff but you know what? Win. We were thinking that exact same thing with the last man standing match with Chris Jericho. But that was okay. You know what killed that? That was not that match. Did not hurt it Jericho. Was the follow -up. It, was, it, it was the follow up, and it's the same thing with this. If Jeff Hardy loses to Hunter. It could either be bad or not bad, and it's not what happens tonight. It's what they do afterwards. If Jeff Hardy loses, it's a fluke loss, and the next main event on the pay-per-view involves Jeff Hardy, and he gets a win back, and he's, from this point forward, in that mix of the top guys, then it was benefit. If he falls back to the exact same spot in three weeks that he, that he was in two weeks ago, 
then the whole intercontinental thing did absolutely nothing for anyone. So it just depends on its future booking is it more than um, you know what they exactly do for results. Anyway, I mean, uh, let's look at like Goldberg and Hogan when uh, Goldberg beat him for the title, and then they kind of buried Goldberg, and he was always like maybe second match from the top, and Hogan was pushed as the top guy, and that win over Hogan still helped Goldberg a lot. But I think that if they would have done that exact same follow up. But Goldberg had not beat him clean, and like 50 men ran in, and Goldberg got a total fluke. I don't think he would have been as big as he managed to still be after they did the follow-up. Right, but if they had booked Goldberg as the new superstar from that win and made that win, and, and not made Hogan the top star, Goldberg would not have cooled off, even while while continuing to win matches, because he was cooling off while continuing to win at that point. Yeah, it's the you know you got it. But anyway, let's let's start with Brandon in West Virginia. Brandon, what's going on? Hey, hello. Hey, how are you? Um, uh, I'm fine. Um, just had a few quick. I was listening to the show and you were talking about uh the, the independents, how they always throw in triple threat and tag teams and stuff like that. Yes. Um, I've been noticing a lot up, up here in college. Uh, we get a lot of the Smoky Mountain runoffs, like Tony Nardo and Justin Case wrestling around. I was uh -huh. at an MDW show and uh, you know, every single time I go to any of those shows up there, there's always a battle royal. That's from a different era, huh? That's from a different. That's from a different. Era. That's another thing out here. Yeah. Um, they run a lot of battle royals because in the '70s, battle royals were a big draw in Northern California. And the fact is, they haven't been in 15 years. But it's like it, it's actually an, another example of the same thing. In the battle royals, you know, I, you know, battle royals usually stink. I mean, almost always. And I think that that's just like one of those things where. Because there was a period, at least, at least, but at least with the battle royals, there was a period in like the um, 70s and even up through the early 80s, where battle royals were traditionally a huge, a huge drawing card. You know, and then people realized how bad they were and, and stopped being a big drawing card. But but with three ways, you know, three ways are just some gimmick that started being done on TV, so everyone thought they could copy them. And you know, I, I just don't know where they what they add to a show, at least at an independent level. Well, yeah, from the ones I've seen, I'd rather have the five worst workers in a battle royal than in single matches all through the card, <laughs> personally. Um, no, I mean, as far as like, but if they're not, but that's just, you're just telling me that guys aren't ready to work. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, that, then, they, then they're not ready. Yeah. What's, um, what's the deal with the uh, Stampede um, going with the WWF again as a territory? I, mean, uh, rumors about I don't think there's any. I don't uh, think there's anything, anything to that, that, that at all. That. Really? I don't think there's anything to that. Okay. Um, they've already got two developmental territories. They got three developmental territories. They got Puerto Rico. They got Ohio Valley, and they got Memphis. I don't. They don't really need another one. Yeah, I just. Uh, I think I read on some site that uh, someone's reporting that uh, Bruce has been in talks with Shane. I think or something like that. Oh, I'm sure Bruce. That's what Bruce has been wanting for years. I mean, Bruce has always wanted. Bruce has wanted that that thing for 20 years, and and for a time in the 80s. They were sort of an unofficial developmental territory. Have been sent guys, you know, like Outback Jack and Ted Arcidi and people like that to learn to wrestle to Bruce. And you know, it's funny the ones who Bruce taught to wrestle never ended up in the WWF, except for I guess Owen. <laughs> but um, and Benoit 15 years later. But um, the uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure he wants that. Every you know, every independent promoter wants an affiliation with WWF right now because there's you know because of the money involved. And and you know for someone else to pay the talent, you know that's 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 a great thing to have if you're an independent promoter. But I don't know. I I, I will say this: I would be absolutely stunned if the WWF works. Like, and, they, and I could be wrong, but I would be stunned if the WWF works uh, uh, any kind of a deal in Calgary uh, with with Bruce Hart, uh, even though Bruce would like it. Yeah. Um, also, I I haven't heard the story behind it, but what what's really the deal between the Michaels Bulldog match and In Your House Eight, where? Michael basically throws a tantrum mid-match. Like, uh, that was uh, it. That was it. They, they, Michael threw uh, tantrums they, in a lot of matches. Yeah, they, uh, it was I just remember like some Bulldog. with Vader, he threw a tantrum. Bulldog Sean, had him like, in a chin lock, and he's just sitting there whining to Earl the entire time he's in the chin lock. I yeah, it was, it was something about... Um, that was the one in Charleston, right? Beware of Dog, where they had all the screw-ups? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I think Sean and Bulldog both were in a really bad mood because the the show was already killed by the power failure, and they felt that they should probably not even do the match. They should just do the match on Tuesday and kill the show, but they brought them out after all this, and, and it was just a bad situation. And then plus, they got off on the wrong foot in the match, and both of them blamed the other one. And, and you know, Sean was a perfectionist, and when things didn't go his way, you know, he complained long and loud. That's another one of the reasons why he's not a main eventer today if he could work um, a match. He's, you know, he's not, you know, that, that, you know, that's one of the why they're predisposed negatively towards him. 
Um, but yeah, that was that was it. You know, because both of them thought that you know why don't we just can this match and and do it on Tuesday. And the decision was no, go out there and do the match. And and then when th there was like I don't remember what the screw ups were, but there were. And then once there were, they never recovered. They never really recovered from them, both of them. You know, Sean must have been so confident with like where he was on the card and that nothing would ever happen to him. Because I remember he threw a tantrum in his match with Vader. When he was like coming off the top to do something, Vader was supposed to move and he didn't. And Sean just starts yelling at him and kicking his head. And I thought to myself, you know, if there was one man that I would never throw a tantrum in the ring with, that man would be Vader because he would kill me. But Sean <laughs> knew nothing was going to happen to him. Um, is there something you were bringing up a uh, sinister minister with that one guy? There's a question mm -hmm. on the email. Um, I I heard that like uh, a fireball. Uh, a fire gig uh, messed up, and he like got really bad burns all over him. Oh, it blew up his finger. And yeah, yeah, like things. he lost part of his hand. Is he still uh, recovering or coming back to wrestling after that? Or he came back to wrestling very quickly after that. He was on ECW pay per views. Um, and like you know, the next just, show. Yeah, he's just you know, if he's just waiting for someone to pick him up, and and you know, if he can get if he can get something going, you know. But um, no, yeah, he was he was back pretty quick from it actually. Oh, that that's that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Um, well, you know, that's all I got, so thanks okay. for your time. Okay, cool. Real quick, I'm going to go to a break right after this. This is a question about the top ten pay-per-views of all time in terms of buys. And um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but um, as far as, like, this is of, of, every, of everything, boxing, wrestling, concerts, there's no concert that is anywhere in the ballpark of the big wrestling and boxing ones. Now, the biggest buy rates were Tyson and Holyfield. Uh, this last WrestleMania was the biggest buy rate ever for a wrestling show. I think there's probably been, I would say, a half a dozen, maybe a little bit more boxing. The big, the biggest ones are all boxing shows, and then the next rung are all WWF wrestling shows. You know, like the wrestle, the, the last couple of years of WrestleManias. Um, but um, and then, then you've got a million wrestling shows and boxing shows, kind of in a mix. You know, between, let's say, you know, three hundred thousand and seven hundred thousand buys. This is from Wendell, who goes, uh, "Whatever happened to Dick Togo?" Uh, I think he's just started back a couple weeks ago with Michinoku Pro Wrestling. This is he'd been working for Osaka Pro, but they had money problems and he stopped working there. This is from JP in San Francisco. The Jeff Hardy push reminds me of the Ricky Morton singles push against Ric Flair in the mid '80s. Um, the reason it does is because that is exactly what it's based on. <laughs> that match, the, the the tag team match was supposed to be Rick Rick Flair and Arn Anderson against the Rock and Roll Express, the one with um Hunter and um Austin against the Hardy Boys. And then the singles push is supposed to be Rick Flair and Ricky Morton. That's exactly it. Uh it goes I remember. So what did Rick Flair say in his first promo after losing the belt? Because I want to compare it to Hunter's last night. He never lost to Ricky Morton. He always oh. beat him. So uh yeah. he did better interviews too. He used to he oh, no, Hunter got a good night. interview last night. Uh, really, on Thursday? I think the thing about it was he was just enraged, and the, the fact that he was so angry about it kind of put over Jeff and the belt as being more than it's been portrayed as being lately. So I thought it was cool. I thought that he was very good in his interview, and then I thought when Austin grabbed the mic, he was so amazing that all of a sudden I didn't think Hunter was all that good anymore. Oh, on SmackDown? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Steve Austin, what a great... Oh, anyway... I mean, I remember the thing about Austin lately is that, I mean, Hunter cuts a good promo, but he cuts those promos where it's one of those things where I'll write down, you know, Hunter could have said what he said in 10 seconds, and it took him 15 minutes. And with Austin, I don't feel like that. It's like, you know, I could watch this for 15 minutes, and it stays good for 15 minutes. There's some, I just, I just, I don't know. He's just some about him. It's like, I, and then I running think he's just the crowd one at a time. That was great. I think he's a more believable character. Yeah. Not that the other. Not that Hunter's not believable, but just oh, I don't know. Some Austin's. Are you kind of so know good. that Hunter is. Um, I think a lot of it is just the way that they've really protected Austin from you know outside. You know they always say for like uh, the wrestling with shadows. You know you can't get Austin out of character. You can't get Undertaker out of character. You know we see Hunter on Conan O'Brien being a geek, and we've seen him in DX acting like a goof. And Austin has just always been this angry redneck in the WWF. And he does the same persona when he goes on Conan O'Brien or whatever. So it's more believable that, you know, this is just a guy that, you know, he hates everybody. Okay, I mean, he goes, uh, I remember the Morton Flair matches being very good. Actually, some of them were awesome. Uh, but there was a believability problem with the feud. Bill Watts told me that, too, by the way. They had a match at the Superdome. And it didn't draw a great crowd. Although, I don't remember what the crowd was offhand. It was a good crowd. 
and he just goes, damn, you know, they had an awesome match, and there's nobody who believed that Ricky Morton can beat Ric Flair, and damn it, that's why the crowd was so bad. And, and he might have been right, too. But anyways, so they slowly beat built... him. What? Ricky should have yeah, won? Ricky should have beat him. Okay, they slowly built up Morton. Ah, he wasn't ready for the world title. It, it, people would have turned on him. At that period, they would have turned on Ricky Morton in a heartbeat if he'd won the title from Flair. Because the guys were waiting to turn on him anyway, which they eventually did. Because the girls liked him so much. They slowly built up Morton by showing close matches on TV and gradually turned him into a somewhat believable contender. I happened to be at one of the Great American Bash stops that summer that had a Flair-Morton title match. And the crowd reaction during the match showed that Morton's push was pretty effective. After watching the SmackDown Thursday... And finding out that a Triple H, a Jeff Hardy rematch would be taking place on Raw, it seems like Jeff scoring the win so early in the feud was a mistake. Actually, I disagree because Jeff needed the win, whereas Ricky yes. Morton was J Ricky Morton was so over in that realm that he didn't need the win for the feud. But you see, the difference is Ricky Morton went on TV and tore Ric Flair's pants off and did all that humiliating stuff to Ric Flair, so he didn't pin him. I mean, Jeff, if Jeff Hardy like stripped. Triple H to his underwear, but they, you know, or, or did something like, you know, poured maple syrup in his hair, he wouldn't need the win either. But, but, you know, with Ricky Morton, it wasn't the one, since everybody would beat Ric Flair one, two, three, they instead concentrate on humiliating Ric Flair. With Hunter, since you don't beat him, by beating him, it's something. So it's, it's actually the same thing, even though the end result of the matches was different. Um, if they're serious about a push for Jeff, they should put him in a, a chase situation where they could build the credibility around the top level guy. Um, I think the whole thing with Jeff is is where they he go from here. He had to be here. built up to where it would be a believable chase first off. Yeah, because you nobody know, would have believed. You can't really have a chase if nobody believes that the guy who's chasing is ever going to get just like Dave was just talking about. Yeah. The other thing with Flair is is that Flair was so believable and that everybody, they, the, the fans believed that everyone could beat him to an extent. I guess in New Orleans they didn't believe about Ricky because that's what Watts said. But with Hunter, Hunter's portrayed so strong that really, unless Jeff beats him, nobody really believes he can because Hunter never did jobs. Or almost yeah. never did jobs. This you know, Scott looking back, also I was thinking of uh, some wins that would have helped elevate people. Remember SummerSlam, where they'd been, you know, hyping up forever that Hunter was going to go for his world title, and this is the only thing he cared about, and he lived his life for it. And it ended up being like that three-way with Austin Foley and Hunter, and ended up with Foley getting the title there because I guess they wanted to swerve people, and everything like that. But that's what I was, that's what I was all about, swerve people. Kind of you know, the steam thing. off Hunter, and even though he got the title the next night. I mean, he wasn't really looked at by a lot of fans as, like, the top guy. And it took a bunch of clean wins over Foley, just beating him match after match after match clean, you know, with the pedigree to get him up there. So, I just well, think you know what they, You know what the big mistake they made with Hunter was? And that was when Russo was writing. During that chase period, if you remember the buildup of that SummerSlam, because I was so mad at, at that buildup. Because remember, they had Hunter do a job for China, and then China was going to be against Austin in the singles match. And then they switched it to a three-way. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They kept changing the main event every single week, instead of just going with Hunter and Austin and building it up hard. And that changing of it, I think, just you know, um, weakened it greatly because that yeah. was the year that they had Jesse as referee, and they did more buys for SummerSlam the year before without Jesse. And remember all the pub that Jesse got, you know, being the sitting governor and everything. And you know, afterwards, uh, you know, it was like you know, your build-up for the main event couldn't touch the year before because you had Austin and Undertaker. Everyone knew what the match was, and you focused on it. This one, you throw, you know, for a couple of weeks there, it was like China's in the main event. Who wants to buy the, you know, against Steve Austin? I mean, they were going all out because there were radio commercials up here during that period that were actually billing China as going for the title at SummerSlam, and I couldn't even believe listening to it on the radio. Like, yeah, what they, kind of a draw? Even if that's not going to be the match in the end. Why would you air a commercial for a match that no one in the right mind could really want to see? Well, they did have China really over at that time, but still, it, it not over it would... enough to headline against Steve Austin for the title. Oh, you're absolutely you're right. You're right. This is from Scott Foy. Uh, I guess I got the perfect idea how they should promote WCW. Raw goes to a commercial and there's Shane McMahon sitting against his black backdrop. He starts off by saying, "Everywhere he goes, people come up to him and ask, where's my wrestling?'" I bet we all see where this one's going. <laughs> he then goes on, on to talk about how WF wrestlers wear panties and how WCW is returning good old-fashioned smouth, ma smouth, smash mouth wrestling. He then goes on a rant about how the WCW wrestlers aren't overpaid like the WF wrestlers, and the WCW wrestlers have more heart and are really in it, not for the money, but for the love of the game. It concludes with WCW uttering the phrase, WCW, it's real wrestling. Future commercials will feature Arn Anderson walking around an empty arena reminiscing about the old days of pro wrestling, and Stacey Keebler inside the locker room talking about what it's like to work in a man's business while stripping down to her bra and panties. <laughs> sounds, sounds familiar. Uh, let's go to one more, and then we'll start going back to the calls. From Joe Hamilton, this is a show that we heard a lot about, boy. Saturday night, CCW in uh, Smyrna, Smyrna, Delaware. 
It was definitely the sickest thing I have seen live in 20 plus years of watching wrestling. Jun Kasai was power bombed from the ring. Wasn't to he the same of... guy that jumped off the building? Yeah, last week. Okay. Same guy. Uh, Jun Kasai is attempting to make his name. Like, I'm, I'm really interested to see those pictures in the Japanese magazines in the next couple weeks of him, because clearly that's what he's doing this for. Um, I, actually, I, I'm going to have a tape of this, hopefully by the end of the week of that CCW thing, but I've been told that, like, I, I was told that it's something that you have to see. It's the bloodiest match in the history of wrestling. Um, and by people who, that, that, that's, you know, by people who've seen, like, every bloody match in the history of wrestling. Not by someone who's, you know. Anyway, Jun Kasai was power bombed from the ring to a bunch of chairs that had been, that had fluorescent light bulbs laid across them. When Kasai got up from that bump, his back was shredded. He had a huge chunk of skin flapping off his elbow. Yeah, they have, like, close-ups of his bone sticking out and his tricep muscle sticking out. Earlier in the show, Rick Blade did a swanton off of a huge, Rider truck through Trent Acid, who was on a table outside the hall. Both landed into, on the concrete. The funniest thing I've ever seen also happened at the show. We were waiting on one of the boys to give him a ride back to Baltimore, and the crew had just started taking the ring down when there was a loud siren that was sent off. It turned out a fire alarm, and a bunch of guys from the neighborhood started running down the street. At midnight, they were volunteers for the fire department wh where the show was held at. And so you have guys like Nick Mondo and Man Man Pondo walking around covered in blood, and you have guys getting their fire gear running past them. I guess, wow, that's pretty strange. Uh, let's see. On behalf of my hometown, Crawfordsville, Indiana, I apologize to the wrestling world for Jim Elwick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's my God. Nice. Let's go to Phil. Phil, what's going on today, Phil? Hey, guys. How you doing? Doing hey. good. Watched a lot of wrestling this weekend, so I was going to talk to you guys a little about it. Um, okay. Man, I heard about Muda, Muda winning, beating Kawada, and it's just so disheartening because I watched that Muda Murakami match from the Zero One pay-per-view. Right. I guess that was no, a Tani and Murakami. No, no, no. I'm talking about Murakami Muda from New Japan pay-per-view. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, was okay, that one. Such a horrible match. Muda well, is Muda, so Muda's bad now. I mean, he couldn't. I mean, he did nothing. And then the knee strike he won with was like the weakest looking oh, thing. Oh, it's so bad. Like, that, that, he, like, that's such a bad finisher. Six inches. And then he just pins him, and I just looked at it. I was like, oh. Yeah. It's that, and you know, you know, what Muda looks amazingly like now is Dragon, the Dragon Master from the JTEX Corporation. <laughs> you know, the ball has a little staff. Yeah, Sakura, Sakura, he wrestles like him too. He wrestles yeah. like him too. It's like, oh, so I mean, the fact that he beat Kawada with that same knee smash, it's just. For yeah, but it's Kawada, so maybe he just laid into him with it. I hope so. Well, it's Murakami. I mean, have you seen any Murakami, Brian? If you're gonna lay into anybody, you'll lay into Murakami. I mean, oh, guy, Murakami's Murakami for a guy who's not who's gone into wrestling from shoot fighting, he's tremendous. Oh, he's awesome. He's like what about? He's not a, not the greatest wrestler in the world, but he's like really my favorite wrestler to watch at this point. He's, he's great. So he's great. In, he's great in angles. Yeah, and he's so surly and you know he's pissed off and he beats the hell out of people. It's just a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. Um, uh You were talking about Jun Kasai. Have you seen any Jun Kasai in Big Japan? Yes, I have. He's not afraid to. Die, die, die. I mean, I remember he had one match against uh, Matsunaga, where Matsunaga put a fluorescent light bulb, a tube in his mouth, then punched him, and like broke it in his mouth. Oh, that's sick. Yeah, <laughs> he like, started spitting out blood, and it was just he was like, what am I oh, watching? That's just sick. So he's just like, Jun Kasai is, yeah, I mean, I remember the first time I saw him, I was like, this See, I don't good. understand the point of doing that to make a name, because, okay, you make a name as somebody that will bleed and have your uh, arm rips with the tricep shows, and uh, what name, where's that name going to get you? Well, I mean, look at, look at, you know, you just brought up a name, Matsunaga. I mean, I, I remember, you know, Matsunaga was the first guy to dive off a balcony. And he sort of got a cult following, but, I mean, he messed up his knees so bad that he never could do Didn't anything. Did he light anyway. his head on fire? Yeah, Pogo lit his head on fire. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Where, where did that, that was, get him? Well, got he, him made of any garbage leagues in Japan until he's a thousand <laughs> yeah, years old. Great. Well, it's, you know, it's a foreign country. Guys, yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's I'm plenty of good people like, doing it. I understand trying to make a name for yourself like Jeff Hardy in the WWF killing himself night after night because he hopes that someday he'll beat Hunter, which he ended up doing. But, you know, to do that and not really have anywhere to go except, uh, you know, top, to the top of the card of, in a garbage. To the top of Japan. Yeah, I just, I don't know. Well, you know, Jeff, but, but uh, Brian, I saw Jeff Hardy take the same sort of stupid bumps in, uh, in armories in front of 75 people in North Carolina before he was even, you know, and, it, and he thought about him beating Hunter in the WWE. And, and look, at, look at the stuff Mick Foley did early in his career. I mean, he did the same stuff for a million dollars, but he did it for $50, too. Yeah, so yeah. It's in, But, I mean, at least when Jeff Hardy was doing it, you had Mick Foley there at the top. And so he's going, well, you know, I take these bumps, Mick Foley takes these bumps, Mick Foley's at the top, 
But, I mean, right now, what guy in a major promotion is making a ton of money is uh, just absolutely, you know, well, so, get his tricep so, ripped out. So, you know, it's like you have that whole, the whole, like, uh, the master-student relationship in, in, in Japanese wrestling that's different from anything in America. I mean, I think, you know, probably somebody like Jun Kasai or somebody like Tomokai Hanma, that their goal is to be the top of Big Japan as something meaningful rather than yeah. headline new I mean Jun Kasai's a tiny guy. I mean he's never gonna headline New Japan. I mean he's smaller than most of the New Japan juniors. But I mean I in a weird way I bet that you know he wants to be Matsunaga because maybe that's who he grew up idolizing and it's some, just something different than America. Well I it's mean. just something it's just the pr the the proving he can take. It's same same reason why, you know, a lot of the guys that do the hardcore stuff in the United States, I mean like I don't how many of them really think that they're gonna end up I mean even though they idolize McFoley, they really think they're gonna end up in McFoley's spot. It's just one of those things it's a you know if you can main it, it's a way to be somebody. I mean, that's what, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, that go to wrestling school, I mean, how many of them really think they're going to go to the WWF? But, but they can be I somebody. I think you'd be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> You're around them more than me, so. <laughs> you would be surprised. And, uh, switching, uh, gears a little bit from, uh, garbage, uh, indie garbage wrestling to indie teen bop wrestling, I watched some Matt Rats the other day. And have you seen the, the Evans brothers wrestle at that match on the Matt Rats days? I don't know They're if I have. They're identical twins. They're very close to identical twins. And, and they wrestle each other. You know what? They're, They're not even related. Really? <laughs> yeah. Because they were. Well, like in like. fact, they came down here. They worked for us. And everyone thought that they were brothers. They talked like they were brothers. They were billed as brothers. And then one day, Jake like, comes up to me and goes, this guy's not my brother. Don't tell Tim. They're not even related. Oh, you see, you wrestled them? Because I was yeah. really impressed by that, the match they had on there. They were moving it, like, as far as the speed and actual, like, specific work rate, like the amount of moves they were doing a minute. It was, like, about as fast as, like, All Japan Women from 95 or some, like, British stuff that I've seen. I mean, they were, like, counters and things like that were just really fast. They had, the, the promotion's booked horribly. Uh, it's like his book is... In fact, I wrestled Jake, like, uh, three months ago, and it was, like, his fifth match. If that tells anything. I, don't know. It, I mean, I was really impressed. I was like, you know, and I've watched the other stuff, and I wasn't that impressed by any of the other guys, but that was like, they were doing some stuff where they were just, you know, like doing all these crazy flip outs and just moving at a really fast speed. So those are some guys that, you know, when that promotion folds, which I assume it will eventually, they seem they to be do, like. Unfortunately. Yeah, that seems to be like those guys had some promise. So that was the match you had with them, Brian. Oh, he did good. He did good. I mean, it was like afterwards, he came up to me and he goes, that was like my sixth match. And it was like, wow, you're awesome. Oh, yeah, I think I have to get a tape of that. Do you have that on tape? Yeah, I have it on tape. Okay, we'll have to get take a look at that. Um, and I guess we're, I'll talk a little about the WWF because I actually watched it the last couple of weeks, uh, which is rare for me. Uh, you're talking about Hunter and the character. And I think the problem that I have with him is I don't buy the vest. The, the, uh, <laughs> the, the French vest he's wearing now? I'm sorry. I don't yeah, know I, I don't, I don't, I don't like it either. With that, but that's my you big know, the problem funniest line you had in the Observer, Dave, was a couple of months ago. It just out of nowhere you wrote, uh, the jean jacket over the leather jacket was uh, a real hot style in the seventies, and I thought. That yeah, was when so I was in when I was in high school, that's, that's what crazy. they would. That's, you know why they would wear it because it was like. Um, actually, you know what? I don't know why. They would wear it. <laughs> People, I used to think it was it ridiculous was then too. Yeah, because it's like, but, but I think that what it was was one of the styles they had then was these guys that like uh, lifted weights, and I don't think too many of them did steroids in those days, but. But they they would wear these like thick jackets, but they would still want to show their arms on these really freezing nights. And I was I would always think like, you know, like great, you know, I lift weights too, but it's freezing out, and I'm not, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> I don't need to show I have big arms in 35 degree weather. But that's what that's what, how I remember the jeans jacket. And then afterwards, then you start doing the the jacket underneath that sleeveless jacket, and I'm just thinking like, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. but, but I mean, it, with with that particular look he's got going with him. The backwards leather cap and the whole like weird homoerotic thing Austin's doing with Rock. It's like they're doing a midnight cowboy tag team gimmick or something like that. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, need to get heat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, because you've got him. I, I, I don't think that you should tell them they're doing that because then they'll stop it right away. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. I somehow do not think that that's their plan. <laughs> that's what it comes off to us, man. It's like you yeah. know this weird, creepy, like top. You know, like a, like a cruising or something like a cruising gimmick. And I thought it was I thought it was just like this these two like um, guys like you know you know bullies that were all together on the same side that it's just sort of like oh my god now they're on the same side. Well, they're so tough and manly and you know he's but because the Ross thing had to be there's no way that was unintentional. The thing with him, what, like what do you stroking mean? Ross's head and come on a pretty oh, hat. Oh yeah, yeah 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 that was that was meant to be creepy but that was more to um. Yeah. I don't think that, I mean, I know it was out of deliverance and everything like that, some of those lines, but I think that it was more to just like, 
mess with Raw. Everyone knew what he was doing, but it wasn't meant. I don't think that anyone has any. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was I don't more think they mind want to games than Austin actually thinking that Ross had a cute hat on. Yeah, I, I don't think they want to portray the idea that Steve Austin is actually homosexual or anything like that. I think that that's the farthest thing from their mind. It just, it's just one of those things where they just wanted to, you know, really harass Ross because Ross couldn't physically do anything about it. Yeah, well, that's what I think they're coming. That's, what, that's the way it's coming off to me, at least. I don't know. Uh, I, th- I, I think that they should. Uh, well, but I think it's think, kind of an interesting angle. It's a, a different way. You're, to, you're, think, you're thinking more about their product than they are now. Yeah, well, you know, it's wrestling. <laughs> we were all guilty of that, actually. <laughs> Um, and I had one other quick question. Um, I watched the Zero One interview. I watched in the New Japan, well, both of them. Um, a couple comments on that. I think Silver King looked so awesome in that six man tag. The junior six man tag was him. Guess Bob what? The, the, oh, the tape I the tape I got started with the second match. I've never seen that match yet. Oh man, you got to get a hand out your hands on that because the parts where Silver King wrestles Minoru Tanaka, they're in there together. It's just so great. Silver King looks like you know he did back when before you know. He looks. He looks like he lost a little weight. He looks a lot more cut, and he just the stuff with him and Minoru Tanaka was just so great. They were so fast and countering each other stuff. Like Minoru Tanaka would do the like shoot style takedowns, and then Silver King would spin around in some weird lucha dos caras thing. It was just great. I mean, Silver King looked, you know, looked like he was the you know top top fifteen, top twenty worker in the world, which I thought he always was, but never could do anything like that. In WCW. <laughs> Every time you see Hell those back. guys somewhere else, oh my god, it's like you should shake. I shake my head. Yeah, yeah, very, sad. People, all the great things Silver King could have done in the three years he took the three year vacation he had. I was like he you might as well had a blown out knee or something like that. And I was wondering is what is, where's Hoshikawa now? Because he had that now Hiro Hoshikawa, he's um he was trying to get a job with zero one. Um didn't he he was working for Osaka Pro and then they left over money and they just hadn't gotten a job anywhere else. But yeah, he had a hell of a match on at zero one. Oh man, that match against Mirafuji. That you know how many stars did you give that? Four. Yeah, I mean that's 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 about. I mean, I don't do star ratings, but that was about what I what I thought it, it was about. Mara Fuji, they were, they're both, they were both they were both real. I mean, that's like an opening match, and you're going like, man, what an opener! Right. I mean, I think Hoshikawa. I mean, Hoshikawa looked really good in the, his end run, like the last maybe four or five months he was in Osaka Pro too. But I mean, that match was just out of out of control, good. And, you know, by far better than anything Mara Fuji's I've ever seen Mara Fuji in. Well, Mara Fuji's stuff lately though is got, he's gotten really good lately. Yeah, it's hard for me to watch that Noah because it's just such I don't know. I, say, I haven't like really enjoyed a single Noah show I've watched. I don't think really. Some, some of them been okay. Some of them okay. Look so bad. All right, so, so I gotta get running, okay? Because we're late on break. All right, see you guys later. Uh, let's see. What have you heard about Triple H Jeff Hardy match tonight? I have not asked anyone because I I just don't want to know. That's the truth. Um, and will Triple H allow Jeff to go over? It's it's not. It, put it this way: if the bookers want Jeff to win clean, Triple H is not going to say no. I mean, I'm sure Triple H himself is actually the one who's putting this program together in many ways. So it's it's he, it's not you got to understand. So it's, he'll it's, come out on top in the end somehow. Well, he'll come out on top on the end, but that doesn't mean he may he may lose tonight. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I don't. I, I mean, the thing is, it's again, it's not the result of tonight's match that's really important. It's it's does Jeff Hardy get elevated from this point? And I I kind of heard an angle that they might do, in which case it it might be a surprise. <laughs> and it'll probably make no sense if they do it. We'll see. Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll find out tonight what they do. Uh, I have a question. Oh, no. What? Oh, you figured it out already? Okay. <laughs> then you, it's, 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 you probably got it then. Uh, it's been bugging me for a long time. What was the name of the fictitious global world championship that Joe Pettacino mentioned on a broadcast of GWF Wrestling in 1991? God, I don't remember. I don't know. Um, I thought, this is from Carl, I thought the one-finger push pin... With Hogan and Nash was a potentially good idea, but it was poorly thought out and executed. Do you think there was any way that angle could have been pulled off successfully? Not without killing the title. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's see. No WCW, no ECW, only the WWF. The wrestling scene here in the UK is now officially dead. Uh, this is from Jay Thompson. I love how the XFL has changed the name of the championship game to the million-dollar game, representing the amount of money that we split among the winners. Given the well-known salaries of the of NFL and other athletes, it's like starting a game show going, who wants to win a few thousand bucks? My question is, <laughs> uh, you have said that WoW can't succeed. Is that because it's women's wrestling or because it's David McClain? It's because of the economics. There's a of, lot of, how, of different reasons that WoW cannot of, survive. Of how they were operating. Um, well, go ahead, Brian. Oh, I'm just saying, I think there's a lot of different reasons. Dave McClain, I'm sure, is one of them. The fact that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a... The audience that they're searching for, I don't even know what it is, if it's young men or whatever, but I don't think that, like, hardcore wrestling fans are watching Raw and Nitro, or formerly Nitro, are going to be interested in GLOW, 
just, you know, production problems, so much money that has to go into it. I think there's like a million different reasons. Uh, what is the status of Tajiri? Tajiri's under contract with WWF. They're just waiting to figure out what to do with him. Uh, let's see. Do you think I'm watching Kai and Ty get crushed by Undertaker and Kane. I think everyone should be happy that Tuck, uh, that he's sitting home and uh, getting paid and not on TV. When I watched Kai and Ty on, on SmackDown, you know what you know popped into my head? It was like, oh, my God, this is what happens when they sign Rey Mysterio Jr. <laughs> yep. Uh, except they, they, except Ray they uh, do, speak English. They do Mexican jokes instead of, yeah, but maybe this character can't because Taka can too. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Do you think Shane Helms will get a top spot in WCW? I, I think he'll get a good position. I don't know about with Taka. I don't know. The thing with Taka, though, is when he first came in, it was like, here's this guy that no one in this country has seen. He doesn't speak English at the time. So it really wouldn't make sense if he's... I guess it wouldn't make sense if Kane started talking either, but he did. <laughs> but, you know, with Ray, everyone's seen Ray talk. They know he can talk and he can speak English. So I don't think that they would take him down... That many notches and debut him as a mute or someone who can't speak English. Okay, just just in in, in the nineteen seventies and sixties, George Steele did great interviews, and then <laughs> later in his career, he he didn't he couldn't talk English. So, anyway, Andy Rapata. Earlier, you mentioned midgets. How come we don't get great midget matches in the U.S. like we did in the seventies? Watch back on tape; they weren't that great. <laughs> I saw many of them. I thought midgets were hilarious and quite entertaining. They they were. You know, for a sideshow thing, and they actually drew in some places and things like that, you know, like a once-a-year gimmick thing for kids. Um, I mean, I, I, I got a kick out of mid the midget gimmick the first time I saw it or the first few times. After a while, you know, it's the exact same match every time out, same joke, so whatever. Because I know Vince Russo tried when he brought in Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice was not a midget wrestler, guys. <laughs> but other than the uh, Al okay. Snow campaign, we seldom see the world-famous midgets. The Al Snow campaign was not good either. Remember when he wrestled those four? Oh, that was horrible. Um... That was funny when Regal got a hold of the midgets, though. Um, yeah. So, uh, let's see. I grew up in Toronto and used to watch wrestling on Saturday mornings at a local wrestling sh school that was filmed in a cheap, spin fe cheap gym featuring just talent as the Mongolian who wore a sheepskin vest and ate goldfish. Could you please tell me the name of the federation? I suspect it was not Maple Leaf Wrestling. I don't know. Don't know. Local thing. How old is Bradshaw? Let's see. He was about 31... When I saw him on a certain day, and what year was that? I'm thinking it was I don't remember these things. Or, so I'm guessing 30, 37, 38. He's older than you think. Okay, here's a note on Batman. Tony Marino and Bruno San Martino won the now defunct WWWF International Tag Team titles, the predecessor to WWF World Tag Team titles. It's now defunct? Victor, the International was, is a punk, yeah. Yeah, they've been defunct for uh, since probably 72. I was, I was kidding. Okay, and then Victor Rivera replaced San Martino. Could you maybe you could ask Bruno the reason behind the title change and replacements? I think that Bruno was the world champion. They probably didn't want uh, you know him to hold both belts, but we can ask Bruno. He'll be here. Uh, there was a report on ForWrestling.com saying that Vincent Jr. told Shawn Michaels to lose his attitude; he would never come back. But now they said we could see him as early as a month. Is this true? I don't know. Um, the last I asked about Shawn was a week ago, and they said that, that uh, he wasn't even that no one even mentions his name as far as like they haven't even brought up considering bringing him back. But you know things change if he. I can't imagine. I I'm can't sure he imagine. was told to lose the attitude. Yeah. Probably about a hundred times. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Who has received the single largest payday for one performance in the history of wrestling? I would guess Hogan and Andre, 750 at uh, WrestleMania in 1987. Um, I, have you ever heard of them? Because I didn't hear what, what like Austin made. Well, he wouldn't. I think Austin Rock may make more this year. But um, mm -hmm. that's the biggest. There may have been someone. Oh, I take that back. That's that's wrong. That's wrong. What about Inoki? Um, you no, know, though that's still wrong. The most that anyone has made for a performance in the history of wrestling was, was Mike Tyson, 3.5 million at that WrestleMania. And the second oh, was, right. uh, Den yeah. was Dennis Rodman, which was two and a quarter million for that, uh, Bash at the Beach match. The most that any wrestler has ever made were Hogan and Andre at 750. Let's go to Scott in Connecticut. Hey, how you guys doing? Hey. Uh, uh, got a lot of things, uh, out of my mind. One is, uh, do you guys think Jeff Hardy needs a new name if they're going to push him? No. No? You think they can go with just Jeff Hardy? Why He's not? good, yeah. Well, I, mean, I, think gimmick name, I think gimmick names are so overrated at this in this day and age. It doesn't matter. Maybe just a nickname, like the Heartbreak Kid Shawn Michaels, you know? 
Oh, they could give Shawn Michaels. They could give him a nickname, but I don't think they need to change the Jeff Hardy part. Yeah, I mean, like Stone Cold Steve Austin, and then most people call him Stone Cold, you know? Well, they, could, they, they could give him a nickname, sure, but... Yeah, that's, you know. what, that's what I think they're going to need to do, because, I, mean, I, I, I mean, when they first gave him the, uh, the gimmick to Hardy Boys, is that kind of like a rib, you think? No, that's their name. That's their name. The, the last name is Hardy? Yeah, yeah they're that's a real Hardy. That's a real name. Uh, so, I, remember so, when, when, uh, I mean, the first time I saw them on uh, WWE a long time ago, and they came out and they were in those, like, those god-awful plaid tights, it was just like the Hardy Boys. <laughs> and I remember uh, I was at the arena, and this woman was there with her kids, and she goes, don't we have some of their books? <laughs> you know? And I was just, I was like, oh, no. Uh, but, I mean, and then uh, another thing is, uh, excuse me, is with um, with some WCW guys. I've heard a lot of guys like, uh, you know, Canyon, Billy Kidman, Ray Mysterio, guys they want, but since they're getting paid so much, the, the, the only way they're going to get them is if, you know, there's, there's such a mark for the business that they'll wrestle for less just to wrestle, you know? Yeah, well, it's, 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 it depends on. I don't think it's so much called a mark for the business, just wanting to m have a career. I mean, I can totally, you know, I, I can understand that. I mean, personally, if I was in a position which you know, it's hard to you know. I mean, you can't really think. Well, you know, if I could have eight hundred thousand dollars to sit at home, what what would I do? But I mean, if I, I'm thinking, if I was Billy Kidman, the guy at his age, you know, the, I mean, the, what could happen is if he gets over and WWF, his contract could get raised, or you know, he could make money on merch. You know, so I mean, I mean the young guy is. When you're that age, you have to realize, okay, maybe I'm making 800000 a year for two years, but in two mm -hmm. years, I'm going to be making zero a year, yeah. and I'm going to be out of the spotlight for two years, and, you know, it may be a lot harder for me to get a job there yeah. at that point. Or, yeah. it may be easy, or it may be easier, because if you're gone for a while, yeah, you can be brought might, as a yeah, fresh face. If you're a bigger name, it's something like in two years, people might really be wanting to see me again, and I can come back and, you know, get a big raise. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, you just you just never know how the you, you never know what's going to happen six months from now in wrestling. I mean, it's just one of those things where, you know, you just got to make a decision and then go with it, and it very well could be the wrong one. Uh, Chris, I had is there, uh, Nick, can you name some other people that fall into that category or get around paid that uh, amount of money? Everyone, like, all the mid carders. Every 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 everyone in the everyone in, basically everyone in the company except for the twenty four guys and the guys mm -hmm. that they don't and, and the few guys that they don't want. Well, I mean, the guys that they are interested in, like Canyon, Billy Kidman. Is there anyone else that? Uh, Scott Steiner, Ric Flair, Bill Goldberg. Well, yeah, um, I know that. I mean, what about GDP, guys that you know could really get mentioned a lot, like uh, Conan and stuff? I don't know what the their wall, status is. You know? Uh, Wall, I haven't heard any interest mm. in the Wall, but I don't know. I mean, he's a big guy. There, sometimes they they like big guys. I I, I don't I and don't I know. I think it's generally guys that you would not want to bring in, probably mm -hmm. would not be brought in. Yeah. Well, this is uh, just want to mention because I talked to someone who's like involved in this. These decisions have not been made at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're this week. This week they are actually uh, doing uh, uh, fact finding. Jim Ross is actually going to be meeting with a lot of people in WCW. And he's asked a lot of people for their input, and then he's going to look at it, and then they're going to start making these decisions. Although, I mean, vaguely, on a lot of the guys, I think they've got a pretty darn good idea of who they want and who they don't want. But, I mean, final, you know, they haven't offered anyone contracts. As far well, as the, guys the, beauty of this, the beauty of this thing is, well, they're the only, they're the only game in town. They, 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 they get an idea. Some, one of the bookers has an idea with a guy. They, they say uh, they come over the character for a guy like maybe the wall or crowbar or something like that. It doesn't work. They, you know, they don't even have to put them under contract till it starts working, you know? No, but they're going to sign it. They're not going to put someone on TV without a contract. Well, I mean, why not though? There's, there's not well, that they're risk not going, anymore. They're just. There's not a no. There's not a why not. They are not mm -hmm. going to put someone on television without a contract. Mm -hmm. Did you guys know Bret Hart's doing an independent tour? Um, he's doing autograph tour? signings and stuff. He's not wrestling. Well, he's, he's going to be um at some shows. The yeah, but he's, he's not. He's not. He's not. Yeah, he's he's yeah. not wrestling at the shows, but he's doing autograph signings. Yeah. 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 I I like that. He's, coming, he's coming over here, and then uh, you know, did you guys hear a new commercial out too? Did you guys hear X Factor's music? Oh, yes, of course. what's up with that? How god awful is that music? It doesn't fit the guys at all. It, do, no, it doesn't fit wrestling at all. It's like, <laughs> it's like a country western. Hey, uh, first, all right, maybe for someone with that character, a song that has that type of feel to it. But just the way it starts, it starts off like a regular radio tune, and then it like kicks that into a, re a wrestling theme. You know, it's so weird. If you put Billy Gunn and X Pac together, it might work. But Billy, no, Billy Gunn. I, I don't know about him. And I'm, I'm hearing he's going to WCW. And you know, if it's that decision they want to kill, made, but they they certainly are leaning. I mean, certainly wanting people to think that, and they probably will do it too. If they want to kill WCW, literally kill, because he's going to drop someone and they're going to die. Put Billy Kidman in, in WCW. Which, you mean Billy, I, Gunn. Billy Gunn? Yeah, I, I said Billy Kidman. Sorry, Billy Gunn. Yeah, when I saw Russell Benoit, and he almost killed him on Raw, <laughs> I was like, no. And then you know what happened the next week? He won the belt. So, yeah, well. 
Well, th- he hasn't won it since, so. And don't you think Austin should get some new music too? No, I love his music. music. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, it's just it's that music that makes you want to pop, you know. I mean, cares or not, you just, just yeah, I know, it. I know, it's, it's babyface music. Well, he, he he did take away the uh, standing on the the corner and raising his hands in the air. Now he just stands there, so mm-hmm. yeah, they've done something. Yeah, what, and you think uh, uh, Shane McMahon's going to have an on-air role? Yes, absolutely. For sure. you think, yeah, so you think well, well, gonna... I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, wait a minute. Of course, the whole thing's going to be built around him. <laughs> yeah, of course he's going to have an on-air yeah, role. He has an on-air role. The thing hasn't even started yet. I don't like. Yeah. He's I, the only guy they've signed with an on-air role. Yeah, I liked an idea that someone had. I don't remember if it was on the law last night or it was on your show today. Was that you know Goldberg? How they should get him over is is that he's not in WCW nor is he in WWF, and he shows up on both shows. You know, kind of like wandering in the back and stuff. You know, for, and, first they have to sign Goldberg. Like he's lost. And you no, know, and, and both. <laughs> and, and, yeah, like he shows up in the desert. How about that? <laughs> but uh, no, but, you know, both Vince and Shane are going for him, and he's kind of like, like I mean, oh, God, no, like I don't want. Oh, he's He's the free agent they're both bidding for. That's a good idea. Yeah, I, I like that idea because then it's more like that can go for a long time. Then you eventually put him in one of the promotions. To do the to do the feud with the other one. That's a good way to you know to draw it out. Did they do that with like Sid Vicious, whether he's going to be a babyface or a heel? One of those years. Mm-hmm. Both yeah, sides I, go. We you know, and then I ended up. Yeah, but I, I really the, the worst thing I'm just thinking Luger, of that promo Tanaka. they had. The promo they had for that pay per view where it, uh, the ad was Goldberg didn't follow the script. I just, <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> you remember oh, that? Was, that well. was in the dark days. It, it was remember in that the, match yeah. where uh, Kevin Nash did like six moves. And yeah. they were playing it up. This has got to be a shoot. He only does three yeah. moves. And then, and then, uh, you know, they did the thing that, where Bill so Goldberg uh, doesn't period. follow the skip, doesn't follow the script, but everyone else on the card does. So they don't matter. But Goldberg does. And I, I was just that saying, whole, I was, that whole period was death. It was yeah, horrible. Definitely. It couldn't have been done worse. One of the things I was at that with the indie show I was at, mm-hmm. I was just talking to regular fans, and mm-hmm. I mean it was just amazing because I started, you know, we were talking about WCW, mm-hmm. and it was just like it was just like. Uh, well, you know, you know that, that they went in there to, that they got sabotaged, right? And I go, yeah. believe it or not, I don't believe they did. I think that it was, I think it was like someone actually thought he knew what he was doing. You know, yeah, no, 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 no. That that was that was total sabotage on that company. Nobody yeah, I don't think they should do that. But I like the idea of him, you know, being a free agent. You know, no, Goldberg is a free agent. Yeah, but they 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 got to get off the diamond, sign him if if if. Do Why don't they? I don't understand. I think they should. Uh, they don't want to upset their salary structure. At least that's what they're saying. I mean, how much does The Rock get a year? Um, the Rock's the like, no, Rock's, is low. Rock's scary. Like he may only be like 500000 or a million, but he's probably making $5 million plus. Well, oh, because of merch and because of outside stuff like movies. Right? No, just from wrestling. But well, merchandise helps too, though, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, so, just payoffs and everything. So, I mean, if it, I, mean I, don't, I don't understand how it's upsetting your, your salary structure. If you got Goldberg, he's going to be an instant top guy and he's going to make a lot of money for you in the long run. Why is it upsetting it to you know put some money as a down payment on this guy? I think that uh, same thing, especially since Big Show got what he got. Oh, well, Big Show. Yeah. Big Show was probably the worst mistake WF made in the last two years. It didn't seem Big like Show. a bad mistake at the time, though. Well, it was, I mean, they, it was like, they, they did their own mistake. It wasn't Big Show. Because, I mean, all right, a guy that size, you, you, there's only a certain amount of talent you, you can have at that size, you know? And Big Show has the amount of talent where you could create a character where he, he's useful. But WWF killed it. I think WWF, that's they, their they, own they, fault. They, 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 they beat him and turned him too many times. That didn't exactly. help. Uh, let's see. Balls Mahoney was banned for life in Maryland, and this is from WoodenWrestling.com. He's got Balls Mahoney told his side of the story as it pertains to being banned for life from wrestling in the state of Maryland in an interview with Gabe Sapolsky uh, at RFVideo.com. Uh, he noted that he's been sus- he's had problems with the commission before. He's been suspended twice. The blood was accidental when Van Dam struck him, reopening a cut from a previous match he had in Michigan. Mahoney said that he immediately called for a towel to wipe his face off. Um, you're not allowed to bleed in Maryland, by the way, um, or, 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 or blade in Maryland. Um, and then he continued with the match rather than go to the finish as he didn't want to cheat the fans out of their main event. When he returned to the locker room, Mahoney was disciplined by the commission's representative who said he should have never gone to the ring if he thought he was going to end up bleeding. Uh, well, that's Which was funny strict. because someone else on the show ended up bleeding, but it wasn't well, maybe, use, so they let it slide. Um, well, maybe maybe the second one got him, got him mad because the first one did it, you know what I mean? Just going, okay, now you're out of control. Um, in regards to being banned, Mahoney said, F-U-C-K Maryland, and suggested fans write to the commission if they don't like the rule regarding blood. Oh, that's going to do a lot of good wrestling fans saying we need more blood. Yeah, right oh, again, man. Gr- that's going to do great for that. That that will be great in that state. Um, it's from Mike who says, Send uh, to the WWF while you're at it. Yeah. Uh, 
the XFL wants the NFL to take concepts and the players from them because if the, if the NFL does that, then it will give the XFL the cre- credibility as a sports franchise. Especially oh, if just the, like it gave ECW credibility. That's right. The XFL is an exciting football league, and I enjoy the games. The XFL is a hardcore football fan's dream. It's second pro football league in the States. It's, it's like when a hardcore wrestling fan watches all the promotions, just the WF. The hardcore wrestling fan likes Japanese, Mexican, and Indie wrestling. The same goes for a hardcore football fan who wants to see the NFL, college, CFL, Arena League, and XFL. I know you two guys. This is this is what I'm going to get the mad hardcore at. hardcore fans were unable to keep ECW in business. Yes. Okay. He goes, I know you two guys hardcore are... hardcore football fans to make the XFL viable. Okay, I, I'm going to get really mad at this sentence right here. He goes, I know that you two guys are against the league, but as a diehard football fan, I love it. I am not against, against this against league. league. I have never I said, I, when, when I give a rating and say the rating isn't good, I am not against this league. When I give an attendance figure and say it isn't good, like when we did with WCW, I was not against WCW. I was trying to explain this company is on its way to going out of business because they are not taking in nearly as much money as they are spending. Therefore, they need to adjust what they do or they will be gone. Now they are gone. The XFL is in the same bracket. It's losing as much money as WCW. It's in the, it's the, it's the WCW of football. All those things we say, but it's that. Anyway. Oh, God. It's, you know, it's like the same. I, okay. Uh, it's like the, I, I got mad the other day too. Someone was going like, well, you love Japanese wrestling so much. And it's like, I love good Japanese wrestling. I hate bad Japanese wrestling. I love good WF wrestling. I hate bad WF wrestling. I love good Mexican wrestling. I hate bad Mexican wrestling. It's not the country. You know, I mean, I, I, I think we got it like the day. Oh, you, all you do is say good things about the, New Japan. And it was the day, it was actually the day we got this email. It was the day of the Osaka Dome show. And I'm going like, please. <laughs> so please listen yes. to the show. We sure and praise th- that show. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's see. So anyway. Just, you know, when giving numbers is not being against the league, saying that the league is losing tons of money is not being against the league. Personally, I enjoyed the league and watched a lot of the games, but it didn't, it's not economically making it. They may, will they make it? Maybe. Is it a good idea in my mind for them to do a second season? No, I think it's a really bad idea. That doesn't mean I don't want them to do it, or I will be glad when they fold. I will not be glad when they fold because people will lose their job. Uh, let's see. Did Jim Cornette really have a mother in Louisville that he talked about in the 80s? Yes, but she wasn't rich. And was Dennis Contry fired and replaced by Stan Lane? Um, no, Dennis just walked out. He just disappeared. And they they had this, all these matches booked. And Jim Cornette, the, the story was Jim Cornette actually, um, he needed to find a partner real quick because Dennis just disappeared and went home. And so they actually tried to get Tom Pritchard for three or four days, couldn't find him. So then they called up Stan Lane, he came to TV, or else Tom Pritchard would have had that spot. So anyway, that's the story there. And why did Cornette leave WCW? Um, he was just fed up with management at the time and just walked out and got mad. Uh, it's from Kobe Anderson who notes, you shouldn't leave the listeners hanging and let them know that John Tenta got his revenge on Bubba by shaving half of his beard off after beating him in a pay-per-view match. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, where were we? Let's go to Robert in Maryland. Robert, what's going on? Hey, what's up, guys? How you doing? Doing really good. Uh, when was the well? I, I guess the better way to ask it is, how do um, how good do handicap matches do as far as ratings go? It depends, it depends on the match and who's in it. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's not like it's a, it's not like it's necessarily good or bad. I, I mean, I. God. I, I mean, can't if they remember had Al even... Snow versus uh, Bull Buchanan versus Billy Gunn. I'm sure it wouldn't do too hot. But if it were like Hunter Austin. Uh, Rock. I'm just talking about handicap, like two on ones. I mean, yeah, Hunter and Austin versus Rock. But and, yeah. and, and 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 in that case, you know, what if Rock like um, almost single handedly defeats them? You know, I'm just saying, like it, it defeats, it, it just takes away from the whole competition. I mean, again, of, of course it's fake, but or excuse me, it's choreographed or or uh, yeah, it's fake. fake, right? But you know. I mean, do you think that's something good to do, or do fans not mind for the most part, or? Um, I think it really I, depends on how it's done. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, I didn't mind like the uh, Benoit Angle Regal match so much because it was done pretty believable. I know Dave didn't like it too much, but uh, I mean, the, just the way that they had the whole match set up, it wasn't like you know Benoit was being a Superman. It was just well, he was, but you know Angle screwed up, Regal screwed up. He right. took advantage of it and made a good match out of it, but he lost in the end. Okay. And um, I, I guess the uh, history question. Um, Back when, uh, way back when, when uh, I guess Kerry Von Erich, when he lost his uh, the lower part of his leg, how I, I actually had a tape, and you know they had the the uh, it was kind of sad to see the hospital interview where he has to say 
okay, the doctors managed to get the you know save the leg and everything, and he continues wrestling. How common was the knowledge that he actually lost a leg in Texas, and I guess among the wrestlers, he, his leg. he lost he lost part of his foot. Um, foot. As far as um, there were okay, there were rumors among a few people that lived in Texas. Um, I mean, you know, but like literally, like maybe a dozen people knew. They thought nobody knew, but I, I just remember like Matt Bourne or somebody saw. You know, like carry a swimming pool, and he jumped in. He wouldn't take his shoes off, which they thought was yeah, really like weird. And when they came out, there was, wow. yeah, he, he went in with a boot, and there was so much water coming out of the boot. They thought that was really strange. So that sort of got some rumors started. What really got it was there was a match in um, Las Vegas, and he was wrestling Colonel De Beers, and accidentally Colonel De Beers took his boot off, and people actually saw that he didn't have a foot. And it was so funny afterwards because after that happened, people didn't. It's like it happened in in, in uh, Vegas in front of you know a couple hundred people. And afterwards, everyone involved denied that it actually had happened. It's like, wow. oh, that never happened. And, like, I talked to people who were, like, in the front row, and, like, everyone's going, like, it never happened, it never happened, the boot never came off. You know, they were, like, in such denial. So from that point, I think, you know, I mean, I wrote about it in The Observer after that, so if you read The Observer, you would know about it. But, um, you know, it was never acknowledged on TV, and it became an issue at the, um, what was that pay-per-view they did with, um, with, with the three groups of the pay-per-view in Chicago when um, WWF actually went to the commission and tried to get the match uh, stopped because um, you know it was like a handicapped guy and it was against commission regulations. So, uh, but you know, they it, it ended up like I don't know why the commission didn't stop it, but they had a match and it actually, actually was a pretty decent match too with Waller and Kerry. Uh, you talked about Marafuji uh, earlier and how good he is. Um, I, and and I agree, but why is he? Um, he seems to have to job in every match. I mean, I understand he's a newer guy, and I guess they're trying to. You know, groom him, but do you think any small, any smaller, and he's working with bigger guys, and that's just that's how they do it in Japan. I mean, he'll get he'll get his time. He'll be a junior heavyweight superstar someday. Do you I think mean, being, do you think he's as good as uh, Shima or Magnum Tokyo right now? Or I think he's better than Magnum Tokyo. I don't think he's good as Shima. Uh huh. And, and, and actually, I, I did. I, I've only seen one Tori Mine tape. It was like a best of four hour thingy, and it was pretty much, I guess, you know, the same six people in the match matches. Uh, I, I guess they're you know six top stars: uh, Magnum, Sua. Uh, Shema, et cetera, Dragon Kid, who was awesome, my God. But, um, the, the, um, the, the thing about Shema, I didn't, I, I know you compared him to Eddie Guerrero at one point, and I mean, the high spots were awesome, but do you think he's as good as Eddie on the ground, you know, like his mat wrestling? I, I don't, I, I don't see At the that. same stage of his career, he's better than Eddie. He's not as good as Eddie was on Eddie's best day, as far as the ground wrestling, but, uh, he's pretty awesome. Okay, and, and, and last uh, last question, I guess. I think you had once compared, um, uh, was it, um, what's his name, uh, Nakanisi um, Mano? No, been... There you go. Lex Luger. Uh, thank you. Now, oh, that's because they do the same. They both do the torture rack, and they're both not very good. Although Nakanisi, Nakanisi has a lot better, better now, but there was a yeah. time when uh, he was horrible for rack. a long time. Yeah, I mean, dance. But... I mean, but I, I think he has more than, you know, the three moves with the, the three clotheslines and then the, oh, God, the torture rack, you know. No, it's spear and torture rack. Right, right. Oh, okay, and, and actually one more question. Um, Yuji Nagata's brother, I guess, New Japan, is that official that New Japan signed him on? I don't know if it's official. I heard it last night. It was in the Tokyo Sports, which sometimes is accurate and sometimes isn't. Uh -huh. So um, I know he left his job at the police force, and the assumption was he was going to sign with New Japan. I haven't, again, I haven't heard 100%. That he signed the contract yet. But and is that's that bad we're... news? Is that bad news for Nagata? Yuji Nagata? Eh, I don't think it's good news or bad news. I think mm. you know. I don't think, I don't think it's going to affect him one way or the other. Okay. Or, you know, maybe they'll maybe they'll form a tag team. I mean, it would make sense. Okay. Well, that's it. Thanks. Okay. Probably be like if Eric just... Angle came in. Wouldn't necessarily be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, hope, uh, hopefully Eugene Nagata's brother will do better than Eric Angle, just because you know as an Olympic silver medalist, you're almost you almost yeah. well, well in Japan you almost have to be pushed because you're real, mm -hmm. and then if you're pushed too much, well, you know I hope he's good because because you'll be it'll be real noticeable if he's not. Um, let's let's go to Heath in St. Louis. Hey guys, I have a couple of things I just wanted to ask real quick, and uh, actually just a comment or two. Um, when you guys were talking about SmackDown earlier, and actually within the week earlier, I thought one of the, I mean, it was not a very good show overall with the wrestling action and whatnot, but one of the big things that I came to a conclusion of, and after reading the Big Show interview, I think somewhere in it was talked about how Big Show talks about, you know, he's, he doesn't really have, like, a gimmick or whatnot. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Are they not making basically saying his gimmick is that he's fat and everybody doesn't want to team with him and he, he's, a, he's a joke, mainly like you know everybody else. Does, that is you know. this week. <laughs> and the one thing that came off what the, what I got that the most out of was with the where they did that little clip with uh, Grandmaster with uh, Brian Christopher and you know, Blackman. And he comes in there and talks and he acts like he's getting ready to fight uh, or you know fight uh, Christopher. When Blackman walks in, he says, "Oh hey, you know he's just he he plays it really well, just being a big dumb animal," which I think that's really what he is. Yeah, I think his acting isn't too bad, and he's kind of funny. I just don't and necessarily want to see him do much in the ring. And, that, and that's probably where he's probably, you know, that's most probably can be, is just little things like that. I mean, that, mm-hmm. that's what I draw from it. I mean, I think that's probably the only, you know, route that they can take with it. And then the other, just two other little things, like with Austin being a heel, like you said with his interview, he comes off, you know, he's trying to, you know, get the crowd to hate him. He's just He's a good heel overall, because that's what he was the majority of his career. But how I'm noticing now... It's like when he's in the ring, like on Raw especially, like after the Hardy, like, you know, SmackDown or whatnot, when Jeff Hardy came down to him with the chairs and whatnot, he just reminded me a lot of Pillman of old, like the loose cannon. You know, how he climbs into the ropes and dangles on the ropes and he jumps up and down, still, you know, screams and whatnot, basically comes off that whole, you know, loose cannon again. And it reminds me a lot of Brian Pillman. I don't know if there's anything to that, of course, but, you know, it's just something, you know. I mean, maybe about. subconsciously. You know, I mean, because, yeah. you know, they were together a lot, and they were really good friends, so they're, you know, they right. be there. And then, finally, with Michaels, I mean, we talked about with his attitude and whatnot, but if, I don't know if you've watched the shooter interview with Shawn Michaels, and I haven't yeah. had the chance to watch Bret Hart, and the big fight of 97, you know, when Shawn, you know, just quit, was it basically, I, I heard Shawn's, you know, reasoning behind it, basically how he said, you know, Bret, you know, point sunny or whatnot, and it just went from there. And mm-hmm. is that really the truth to that, or, you know? I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. I, they didn't, no, one, no one called me up and uh, had the phone running <laughs> when it was going on, which has happened in the past. Well, what all? Uh, but what, what, what's your take on that? <laughs> what? What, what oh, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't. I don't know because it's, it's like I said. I don't care. I mean, I mean honestly, Brett and Sonny were good friends, and Sean had a big mouth, and that's how uh, things start. I mean, it may have been the case. It may not have been the case. But it may, it may was, also not be true. It may also not be true. Yeah. I'm sure that's what led to the fight. Oh, it is what led to the fight. Hello. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thanks okay. a lot, Dave. Oh okay, yeah. Let's go to Dan in Chicago. Dan, what's up? Hi. How hey. you guys doing? Doing really good. Dan. Good. Um, hey, listen, I just want to let you guys know that, well, this weekend I was heavily into the Bre- whole Bret Hart, Vince McMahon deal, you know, with the, with the documentary, and then I went ahead and listened to your show from uh, last year, and I, I, as I was listening to it, uh, they, I guess, said that, well, you guys said that Bret Hart had a meeting with Vince McMahon. When was that? Uh, was that, like, after the Owen died? Which, no, which, which one? Oh, the They're one on the, the one that was not on the bridge? The one on the bridge? No, the one that he said that he was afraid that Bret Hart was going to kill him. Yeah, that was on the bridge in, in Calgary. Uh, would have been. Um, or it was the in the day park. Be- the, it's on the bridge at the park the day before. Um, um, yeah, it was in the park that Bret Hart would ride his bicycle at. It was, um, I think, it was the day before the day of um, Owen's funeral. Oh, really? Yeah. How would I? Yeah. Now, how did that come about? Go to the bridge, so. Who approached right, who? Was, what? Who approached who? I think it was mutual. I, this, Okay, you know what my belief is is that Carl DeMarco tried to work as a peacemaker, and he told Vince that Brett wanted it, and he told Brett that Vince wanted it, and neither of and, and when they both got there, um, it didn't you know they didn't make peace when when all was said and done. That's my feeling because I know that both Brett and Vince both claim the other one wanted it, and I, you know, it, it could have been that Vince wanted it because I'm sure Brett wasn't lying in that situation. So that's you know, but but I got this feeling that it was Carl DeMarco. Who told both of them the other one wanted it? Okay. Trying to like you know, because Carl DeMarco forever is trying to get Bret Hart into the WWF because he thinks you know it's good for Canada, Canadian business, and that there's so much money in Bret Hart. I mean, he's still trying to this to this day. He still wants Bret Hart in there to do the Bret Hart Vince McMahon feud. Yeah. Now my question is, what's uh, Bret Hart's contract is involving WCW? Is he still under contract? He was fired. No, no, no. He was fired some time back. Oh, he was because of his yes. injury, right? Because of his injury, right? Why? Why did they? Oh, because it was so long. For him to come back, that he didn't know yeah. when he was going to come yeah, back. Yeah, and, and then he re- then he retired a couple of days later. Okay, now uh, I emailed you. I don't know uh, the other day because um, he had said that he wanted to come on your show and say it. He never did. So what's up with that? Brett, no, Brett was on the Brett came on the show uh, right after that. And he did his retirement thing. Okay, I think he actually went on the law on a Sunday and then retired 
here on a Monday, if I recall. But I mean, he retired. He sent out a thing on his website probably like yeah. on, on that Friday of that. I saw week. that. Yeah. Yeah, he was on the he was on the show like just a couple days later. Was it archived? I don't see it uh, archived. I just saw that. I just heard that one with the with the Vince McMahon stuff. I didn't hear okay. anything. Uh, okay, I don't know. I don't know if that one. I don't know if that one is. But I mean, uh, yeah, he was on. Can you get him again on the show, maybe? Uh, I would like to get him again. I don't know if he wants to do it again. I mean, I actually like sent the word a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't heard him wanting to do it. So, um, I'm, I'm sure when his book know. comes out, he'll probably want to come on. When, when it, he he will come on the show when his book comes out. Right now, he's he's trying to actually not do things like this. Okay. Um, if you notice, there are not a lot of Bret Hart radio interviews out there. Yeah. And um, you know, he's trying to concentrate on his book right now. And he's you know, one of my favorite wrestlers, and I really admire him and his family and what they've been through and. I don't know, I was just into that this weekend, and I don't know, I think it'd be good to have him on the show again. You know, it's, I would love to, I'd love to have him on. He's welcome to come on any time. Um, we are totally okay. out of time. Okay. Uh, okay, tomorrow on this show we are scheduled to have Ken Shamrock, and I say scheduled. <laughs> Wednesday we're supposed to, we were, we're gonna, we, 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 I'm sure we'll have Bruno San Martino. Uh, what, what, Al? We will have Bruno, that's confirmed. I spoke to him earlier today. Okay, good. So that's really good. So, uh, so Wednesday will be really, tomorrow we'll be able to talk also about, uh, Raw tonight and, uh, more stuff about what's been going on in wrestling. So anyway, we'll see everybody tomorrow at 5.